My name is Brian Worrell, District 4 City Councilor, and I am the Chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. Today is May 21st, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings that begin in April and will run through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. One, attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov backslash council budget. Our next scheduled hearing dedicated to public testimony is Tuesday, May 28th at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person. For in-person testimony, please go to the table by the front entrance at the auditorium and sign up on the sheet, uh, on the sheet at the entrance. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation, residence, and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Two, you can email your written testimony to the committee at CCC Dot wm at boston.gov or three submit a two-minute video of your testimony through the form on our website for more information on the city council budget process and how to testify please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov backslash council dash budget today's hearing is on dockets number 0670 through 0672 orders for the fy25 operating budget include an annual appropriation for department operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Docket number 0673 through 0675, order for capital fund transfer appropriations. And docket number 0676 through 0678, orders for the capital budget including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. These matters were sponsored by Mayor Michelle Wu and referred to the committee on April 10th, 2024. The focus of this hearing will, will be discussed the FY25 budget for the law and treasury departments, including the collecting division. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues in order arrival, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Murphy, and Councilor Braden. I'd like to now introduce today's panelists testifying on behalf of the administration. First assistant collector treasurer from the treasury department uh, for the collecting division, um, Maureen Garceau, deputy treasurer, treasurer Deputy Treasurer, Treasurer De um, Department, Collecting Division, Deputy Treasurer Bradley, Corporation Counsel for the Law Department, Corporation Counsel Cedarbaum, and Chief of Staff for the Law Department, Chief of Staff Ortiz, and First Assistant for the Collector Treasury for the Treasury Department, Collecting Division, First Assistant Barton. The floor is now yours. Uh, they do all the slides first? Yeah, whichever one they have teed okay. up. Um, yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Cedarbaum. I'm the Corporation Counsel. Uh, with me today uh, from the Corporation Counsel's Office or the Law Department uh, is the Chief of Staff, Pilar Ortiz. And um, just want to oh, sorry, take a minute to introduce the department. The, the law department is essentially uh, an in-house law firm 
representing the city of Boston, namely its, its departments. Uh, the core of our department and our most valuable asset is the dedicated team of support staff, claims analysts, paralegals, and lawyers who perform the work of the department. Uh, this team's job is to advise city departments, perform transactional work on behalf of those departments, and to defend and represent the city, its departments, and its employees in litigation. Um, we are part of a larger sort of city team that works to deliver uh, for constituents, but as a central department, we do that by supporting the work of other departments that work more directly with and deliver services directly to constituents. So our, our clients really are internal. We do not represent as lawyers, um, members of the public. We represent city departments. <clears throat> That, that team, or the department, is organized into different divisions aimed at sort of delivering that work and supporting and representing our various departments uh, sort of in a way that makes sense according to their needs. Uh, the majority of the team is based here in City Hall, but we also have staff located at the police department, the school department, fire department, inspectional services, public facilities, and the mayor's office of housing. Uh, the org chart up here in our slide uh, essentially lays out the different divisions through which we deliver the law department's work. Uh, our work starts with the operations group. Those are the administrative professionals who make sure that the department runs and support everybody else in the department in, in their work. Uh, here in City Hall, uh, the legal work is broken into sort of two main divisions, the litigation group and the government services division. The litigation group, uh, the lawyers there, are dedicated to defending the city in a variety of lawsuits, um, ranging from torts claims for you know, injury, negligence, property damage, uh, and employment and civil rights claims. The government services division uh, functions more as an in-house team supporting the majority of city departments. That means that team advises and performs transactional work to support and facilitate other departments' work. That team also has a litigation function of defending sort of regulatory and policy decisions that um, the city makes. So for example, zoning lawsuits. Um, some departments are so large or present um, sort of unique workflows that we have teams dedicated to their representation. So that includes the police department, ISD, schools, and the public facilities department. We also have a, you know, a single lawyer at uh, the fire department and mayor's office of housing. <clears throat> In addition to those divisions that provide legal representation, uh, we do have some other groups within the department that perform specialized roles. So we have a tax title group that works with Treasury to sort of manage and resolve tax delinquencies. We have a claims division that reviews, analyzes, and where appropriate resolves um, pre-litigation claims for property damage or negligence that are presented to the city. And um, the city's public records team is housed within the law department. That team supports all the city departments in handling their ever-increasing demand for public records. Um, <clears throat> so I'll do a quick summary of our budget. The law department's budget is basically comprised of two parts, right? Three quarters are personnel expenses, uh, because as I just discussed, uh, the department is primarily just operates um, through its personnel. Uh, about a quarter of the budget is dedicated to contractual services, which for us is largely outside council costs. Um, the teams and the divisions that I just described are the personnel, um, and that's where three quarters of our budget is. Um, like all municipal law departments, we do use outside counsel. Um, we use outside counsel for a variety of reasons, but essentially where there's a conflict of interest, um, we often represent multiple defendants uh, in the same case and conflicts can arise. Um, for complex or specialized matters where we don't have the expertise in-house, or uh, as a matter of staff capacity, where a 
lawsuit or issue is so time sensitive or so resource intensive that we don't have the staff capacity to address it, at least on the requisite timeline. Um, outside counsel is primarily used for litigation, uh, but we do use it for other matters like employment advising, telecom work, and specialized permitting work. Uh, on the budget pie chart there, I, I don't want to ignore the small but critical piece of the budget that goes to legal technology. Uh, in the coming fiscal year, that's actually going to be a big focus for the department, um, both in terms of starting the work to assess and potentially procure a new case management system. Um, but also, uh, we are doing a lot of work this year to sort of standardize and implement standard operating procedures for conducting e-discovery. And that's going to end up, I think, uh, intersecting with and being reliant upon our use of our, um, our legal software. <clears throat> I want to hand this to you. So um, as we move to the personnel overview, I just want to say, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have that team of, of almost 70 dedicated administrative professionals, claims specialists, paralegals, and lawyers delivering these legal services. Uh, it's a highly accountable team that takes responsibility for a huge number of contracts and legal hearings and lawsuits and policy drafting and negotiations and all sorts of other legal work that comes into the department each year. And, um, you know, just really uh, appreciate their work. And I would like to ask Pilar Ortiz, the Law Department's Chief of Staff, to speak to you a little bit more about uh, that team. Thank you, Adam. So our team is made up of more than just attorneys. It really takes a variety of roles to get our work done and to do it successfully. Uh, we have a total of 69 full-time employees, 53 of which are attorneys. Uh, management oversees kind of the overall structure of the department, and we have managing attorneys that oversee the specific groups that Adam mentioned earlier, such as government services, uh, ISD, BPS, et cetera. Uh, we have article clerks and paralegals that are distributed throughout the different divisions, and then we have our support team that provides front and back office support to make sure that our department runs smoothly all the time. Looking at the demographics, the, we know that the Boston legal community, the demographics do not necessarily reflect that of the city as a whole. That being said, we are aware that having staff that is more collectively representative of our constituents can contribute to our ability to solve the problems that our clients face and understand the issues that are before the city. We often hear that public sector salaries are trail behind uh, those in the private sector but we are not daunted by that. We do not let that limit our, our recruiting or our hiring process. By increasing our connections in the legal community, we have ensured that our hiring process is representative and includes diverse backgrounds from recruitment through hiring. And through regular review of our salaries in relation to work experience, we are able to provide more transparent and more equitable starting salaries for anybody who comes into the department. We see the work of advancing our office culture as really integral to improving the operations of our department. This fiscal year, we have documented an equity-focused hiring process and expanded the groups we engage with, including first-generation college graduates and Native Americans in the legal community. Uh, obviously, we are not limited only to those. We reach out to our a wide array of affinity groups, including the LGBTQ Bar Association, the Women's Bar Association, um, the Hispanic attorneys, and many, many others. We continue to create specialized roles, making sure that we are dedicating all of our resources and rethinking the way that we run our department. This includes a new attorney dedicated to public records at the Boston Police Department and also legal operations analysts to support our e-discovery operations. And finally, for the first time, we have established a training minimum requirement to ensure that all of our staff members are empowered to continue and supplement their legal education, whether they're attorneys or not. There you go, Adam. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Um, and again, I I'm, I'm proud of the seriousness, quality, and integrity of the work that the staff you just spoke about um, bring to representing the city. And um, really just one note again, I appreciate everything that that team delivers. Um, for our city. Um, 
you know, between, between all of this sort of departmental work that we advise on and support and the lawsuits, claims, and public records requests that come into the city, uh, obviously the, the team has been very busy o over the past year. Um, such that it's, it's really difficult to sort of lay out specific uh, accomplishments, or I would say better to like pick which ones are, you know, the, the highlights. Because the main point here is that the law department's accomplishments all come in the form of supporting and representing the work that other departments perform, right? So our accomplishments are fundamentally helping other departments get stuff done for the people of Boston. So, you know, we have some representative accomplishments in this slide. We have some representative accomplishments in the other materials we submitted. Um, but I think that the thing that I really, really want to highlight is our work. Um, and we're really fortunate to have this opportunity as, as lawyers. Like, but, but our work is to support the work that sort of the non-central departments of the city of Boston do to deliver. Um, for the people of Boston. Uh, and as we think about the coming fiscal year, that concept is, is our touchstone in terms of our, our goals, right? How do we continue to, uh, you know, the goals, our internal goals to help us sort of better perform that task. So, you know, our goals for the coming fiscal year, uh, as always, because our team is so critical to our work, is to recruit, retain, and train a, an excellent workforce um, to sort of support that workforce in doing its, its, its best. Um, as a management team, we're trying to proactively identify some of the large pieces of upcoming legal work or projects that, that will hit the team. Things always hit the law department in a really time sensitive way. Uh, we would like to um, make sure that we're working with our clients to identify some of those big pieces of work uh, somewhat in advance so that we can help uh, train, prepare, and make our staff available for that. Um, also related to that and taking the next step on the training minimums that um, Ms. Ortiz mentioned, um, we are going to sort of formalize annual training pathways within each division of the law department. Um, and for us, a big piece of that this year will include uh, standardizing our e-discovery procedures. Um, and then the last goal on there uh, is actually just really a representative goal. I wanted to include something on there that uh, represented that our work uh, is fundamentally somewhat reactive to what comes in the door. So as we make goals for the year, uh, we always have to remember that one of the goals is going to just be to try to handle in the best, most professional, most systematic way um, whatever new big challenge uh, comes in the door. So I picked uh, one for this slide, right? Last year we got a couple of large wrongful conviction claims that came in. Um, you can't predict these things, but when they come in, it's always a goal of the department to um, shift gears, devote resources to it, and take this new task really seriously. So uh, that belongs on there because I don't know if that will be what the next cases are next year, but there will be something that comes to the department and it's gonna be our job to adjust and not simply say um, whatever we wanted to do in fiscal 25 is the priority today. So um, that's it for our overview of the department. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's me. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. counselors. So I'm Maureen Garso. I'm the treasurer of the city. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about what our, di our division does, the, the treasury side of treasury, and then Celia will follow behind and talk about the collecting piece. Um, 
Celia likes to say she collects the money and we spend the money. So um, we'll so talk she a little has bit. More friends than we do. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about how we do that. So um, as you notice from the the budget that we put forth, the ma the majority of our budget is for personnel, and with a few lesser line items for postage and contracted services. We put together a few slides today that represent um, the work that's done by the treasury team and and why the personnel is so important and valuable to the city. Um, this org chart shows that the Treasury Division is broken into four essential sections. Um, we have the Finance Operations Team, the Trust Section, the Community Preservation Team, and the Finance Team. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what each of those groups does and um, happy to answer questions afterwards. So a little bit about the next one. Um, yeah, that's illegible. Hmm. I apologize. I can see that that's illegible to you. Um, I don't know why. Um, we all have copies. Okay, Sorry. good enough. So, um, so, so the administration, you know, that's uh, myself, and I apologize, Jerrica Bradley, the deputy treasurer. Um, what we do is, you know, over overarching the responsibilities of the entire treasury division we're the stewards of the city of boston cash and investments we oversee the collection and disbursement of city funds we manage the city's financial operations and debt obligations and we maintain the banking investment and public and financial relationships throughout the city so now we'll dig down into the teams that do you know the, the true work um, the community preservation team, I know that you're all aware of them and they were here um, just last month and this month you approved their 2024 awards of um, just over $38 million for 57 projects. Since the first funding round in 2018, 347 projects have received grants throughout the city for more than $190 million for affordable housing, open space and recreation and historic preservation. This program has really become quite beloved in the, in the uh, city, and we're very proud of, of the work that they do. Um, the next section is the trust section. Also came before you uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, <clears throat> asking for approval of the cemeteries trust dis distribution. <clears throat> and those 11 cemetery trusts are just a portion of the 350 trusts that are managed by the trust section um, of the of treasury. <clears throat> so again, all sorts of operations, all sorts of trusts, I'm sure you're very well aware of many of them that exist throughout the city. Um, and another critical responsibility of theirs is the oversight of the trust investments valued at about $1.3 billion. About a billion of that is OPEB. Um, but again, <clears throat> a lot of work goes into that and they are certainly uh, an important member or division within our t team. Now I go on to the kind of the nuts and bolts of treasury and, and what we all think of um, when we talk treasury. <clears throat> the, it's the operations team. They're the accounts payable, the payroll, accounts receivable, and the accounting team. Very high volume and customer service driven. <clears throat> We've put some numbers on, on these pages to, to give you an idea of the volume that they put out, um, <clears throat> and the critical importance of the work. We all, we all work to get paid, and, and they do that for us. Um, they make sure that all the personnel and vendors are paid. All money's owed to the, cities for to the city for loans and receivables and taxes, other than taxes, excuse me, are collected. And that all the accounting, state and federal reporting, and <clears throat> ex taxes paid are processed timely and accurately. So again, <clears throat> excuse me, the true nuts and bolts of our department and, and what you think of as our core work. And the final team um, is our finance and compliance team. As you can see, there's a myriad of crucial responsibilities. It, literally, it's the strategy and analytics to support our investments in bond deals. Um, you know, I, I, I know that this year when we, when we submitted the budget overall, there was a reference to increased investment income and and that is really the strategy is is within that team the bond deals um you know we work with our financial advisors and the strategy is with, within that team so um again <clears throat> i just wanted to spend a few minutes just to talk about this is who we are and this is why we're asking for um 
pay, payroll and to support the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge that <clears throat> Council Braden, Council Mejia, Council Fitzgerald, and Council Weber has joined us. Um, I'll go back to <coughs> the rest of the presentation. I'm Celia Botten, um, first assistant collector treasurer on the collecting side. Is that better? Better. There you go. Um, Celia Botten, first assistant collector treasurer on the collecting side. Um, we collect all the taxes for the city of Boston. Um, the collect uh, mission statement is we collect taxes on all other monies due to, from taxpayers. Um, in a professional courtesy manner. Last year we closed, um, our collection rate was 99.2%, and that's because of all the hard work that the department does. Um, we got excellent staff, we break it down into a few programs. Um, so we have the management um, group, which would, does the hiring, the supervising, and all the training of the department. Um, our next group is Special Collections. So Special Collections handles real estate, personal property, motor excise. It manages all the legal um, title research for tax title properties, delinquent accounts, and include uh, sending accounts up to law department for foreclosure. Um, this department is, this section of our office is key. This is the one that deals with the taxpayers, that helps them, we're not into we're not in the foreclosure business. We see somebody come in that needs assistance. We reach out to this um, age strong. We reach out to the home center. We try to find some help for these, these people so that we don't, you know, they get any more in the arrears. Um, and when they're paying us, we just make sure we don't send them forward to foreclosure. We try to do everything in our power to help them out any way we can. Um, we do a lot of letter campaigns. So people aren't getting surprised at the end of the year if they got a lien on their property. And we research with the law department on accounts that have been petitioned to try to help them get into some kind of a, with the home center, some kind of loan or finance. So it's key and we got a wonderful staff that's very patient and work very professional. Um, our next department is the payment services and that handles all the mail. Um, the tellers at the window, all departmental deposits. This, this area, so we mail out total a year, we mail out over a million bills um, between regular bills and demand notices. There's 300,000 motor excise that come from the registry of motor vehicles, and there's, we do 175 bills for real estate for every quarter. So total in that and total in these delinquent letters that we, uh, bills we send out, it comes out to a million dollars. So this area works with all the mail that comes back, works with our lockbox to process these payments. And we handle all the bills we mail out. Um, the next section, we only have four, um, four sections in our office. And this is the accounting quality control. Um, this part of the office handles all the postings, um, we try to automate as much as we can um, to make things easier for homeowners. So we work with mortgage companies. If you have a mortgage, we'll send your bill electronically. We send you a bill, then we send it electronically so the bill gets paid through the mortgage company. Um, we do the same with motor excise. If you have a lease car, we'll send out to the leasing companies. This saves the city money in postage because we can do electronic files going out. And then we try to create anything we can. We send out delinquent um, files to mortgage companies too, just so they're aware if the person is not, um, is behind in their taxes. So um, with all that, most of our budget is between personnel is postage, because sending out a million bills a year is, it's a lot of postage. <laughs> adds up, it adds up. Well, it adds up, so. Thank you uh, um, for your work. You 
Yep, and thank you for the presentation. Now we'll go over to my council colleagues uh, for questions, starting with Council Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the legal, the legal team and the Treasury team, the important work that you're doing. It, it goes over well with the residents, and I think we're in good hands with the legal team and with the Treasury financial people here, and just want to acknowledge the important work you do. I, I, I actually enjoy going down to the mezzanine level <laughs> and, and paying my taxes in person. And, and I, I do that because the, 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 young, the young women that are working there do an exceptional job and they're very professional, but they, they work hard and they greet the customers, they greet the residents uh, with, with respect. So I love, I love seeing that. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah. Um, Adam, I, I was just looking at one of the stats. I couldn't read it all that closely. Staff demographics. Um, I see there was a section in there about um, race, ethnicity, but I, I and I saw our Asian population, but I couldn't see what I couldn't determine what the line was for them. I'm going to have to see if, if Polar's eyes are better than mine. Um, because when Count, Councillor Flynn, um, I, I apologize. I, you know, I do not. Uh, I'm having the same challenge reading the black and white slide that you okay. are. Okay. If, if it would be all right, um, you know, we actually, this information all comes from the, like, a city employment dashboard. Uh, can I commit to just following up with that? We will sort of pull that piece of information out and highlight it in a follow-up response. That, that's, that's perfect, Adam. That's not a problem. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I always look for the most um, difficult thing to ask you to. So <laughs> I, wanna, I, wanna I would have thought it was just a number. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I, 8.33. I, I like keeping people on their toes. Sorry. Okay. 8.33. Of, of that, how many, how many people of the 8.33 speak Cantonese? I do not know the answer to that, Counselor. Okay. Uh, we can follow up. I, I believe that in terms of the, the only insight I have into that off the top of my head is um, you know, a couple of years ago, the city had like a sign up for uh, multilingual staff to just kind of be on, on call, I think, for the LCA office. And my memory is that we didn't have anybody in our department who signed up for that for Cantonese. We okay. do, however, have one Mandarin speaker, and then we have one paralegal who's actually from Taiwan. So, so you have one Mandarin speaker? Yeah, and yes. also one paralegal who is from Taiwan. Okay. Um, most people in, in my district that are, that are Asian speak Cantonese, and that's why I always uh, frequently ask that question, as I, I'm always trying to see what the numbers are, but when we do recruiting, if we can take a look at any Cantonese-speaking lawyers or professionals as well, I, I do want to make sure that city government is reflected with Cantonese speakers. Um, it's important in my district. Um, Adam, let me go back to you. In your budget, about 25% is towards outside council. Yes. What percent, or what is the figure, maybe not percent, but what is the figure of claims against the city, legal claims against the city that the city paid out because of a particular case that went to court? Or, or was settled before court. How much is this? How much did the city s settle last year? Mm. Um. <clears throat> I do not have that total amount in front of me, but uh, it is absolutely something that we can pull together and provide as a follow-up. And could I get the? figure for 
what's what it, what is current also for this year, 2024, January to to the present? Y yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'll, we we can we can pull that information and we'll we'll sort of we'll go back a couple of years and break it down a little bit so that you can sort of see past fiscal year, including this calendar year. Okay. Wait a second. Adam, what is the starting salary of of a young attorney coming into your office? Uh, $86,000. $86,000. Okay. Doesn't seem all that high when when that young person also has a um, tuition payments that they're they're also dealing with. Um, how were you how were you working with that young attorney to assist them with that um, tuition fee, tuition bill that they have to pay every month? It, it, it. It's a really good question, Counselor, because this is, uh, like, not surprisingly, is a real area of, of challenge for us in recruiting, hiring, and retention. Um, in terms of, like, specific to that question, um, the, the big thing that we can offer is that public service uh, is connected to um, really good federal loan forgiveness programs. So our attorneys are eligible for the public service loan forgiveness. So we're always pitching people and reminding them, um, we, you know, there, there's no way to avoid the fact that salaries obviously are different than in the private sector, uh, but our attorneys do qualify for that. Um, so that's really the only specific thing that we offer on that front. And when we're looking at our starting salaries, we do try to make sure that we are taking into account if they've done extra education or have a particular expertise that is really beneficial to the direct work that they will be doing. Uh, so we try to make sure that we are, again, as I mentioned, transparent about how we're doing things, take into account, we always take into account someone who, you know, pitches a higher salary and try to see how it measures out while being fair and equitable to our attorneys that are already in our department. Oh, okay. Not only is it recruiting, but it's the retention that even if the person was making ninety thousand after a year or ninety five a hundred thousand dollars after a year, they could easily go in the private sector and make more money. So what you're saying is continue working with the city because of the uh, possibility of the loan forgiveness program is is that accurate? That's, that's uh, one of the many benefits, but on top of that, we do actually, when it comes to public sector salaries, we do pay more than some other offices. Okay. Do you have another question, Councilor? Yeah, I, I had one other question. Um, um, yeah, thank you, to the, thank you to the legal team. And just to the financial um, team, again, thank you for the important work you're doing. Um, I guess my question is, when there's a lien on, on a piece of property, mm -hmm. um, can you tell me exactly what that means and what the process is for someone to get that lien off the, off the books? Okay, so we place liens every December for the previous fiscal year, <clears throat> which means that the city files a um, taking at the Registry of Deeds, and that goes on the account. Um, they can't sell it or um, transfer a title, refinance without paying that. So what that is, is from the previous year, they didn't pay some taxes. Um, at that point, we send out, so legally you can't do anything for six months once we place the lien in December. So what we do is in probably March or April, we send out these notices to taxpayers, just letting them know that the um, account is outstanding and they should, you know, call the office if they need help or whatever to pay the bill. Um, we also take the current bill and we put the delinquency on the current bill. So when you get your first quarter for 2025, if you had a lien from 2024, that would go on your current bill with an amount, with the um, notice that you have, you're outstanding. 
Um, at that point, we just keep up with letter campaigns and we do phone calls. Um, we don't really petition the property, um, probably for like 18 months, because we're still trying to collect as opposed to having the property go upstairs to, and get put into land court. Excellent. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Murphy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for being here. A few questions. Um, no, to the law department first. How many claims did the city face in 24? And if you could compare that to other years. Um, so these are uh, approximate numbers. Um, so in, in, you know, for the last few years, uh, the number of claims and I'm, I'm just talking about claims that went to the claims division, uh, sort of for an injury or property damage. Um, that is in 2023 was just under 200. Uh, th this year, uh, it's actually a little high. We've got about 180 so far this calendar year. Um, and that's, uh, obviously on track to be uh, you know, significantly more than the year before. Uh, in, in 2022, the number was also just under 200, I think. Um, so there's a little bit of an uptick, but I don't know much beyond that how it breaks down. No, that's helpful. Thank you. You mentioned when there are times you need outside counsel. Is yeah. it based, maybe both, but is it based on the content of the case or is it based on your staff isn't able to take it on the I, I, I think you were right it's sort of both, both right okay. um, sometimes it's it's not anything unique about the content sometimes it's simply um, you know we represent employees acting in their employee capacity and we represent the city so a, a lot of lawsuits that come in uh, have multiple defendants. So there will be maybe four named city employees and then the city of Boston as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different defenses than the employees and um, right, because these cases sometimes depend on whether the alleged wrong was pursuant to a city policy or practice, or if it wasn't, right? So uh, sometimes not everybody has the same defenses in a lawsuit, even though we're all co-defendants, who the law department ordinarily would represent. Uh, so in those cases, the, it might not be anything particularly unique about the case other than that, um, just, just a factual question of whether we, our defenses are aligned. Um, sometimes, the the case is unique though so for example this year we had a case where um and you'll you probably heard in my presentation i mentioned um sort of we're doing some uh, prospective work to um, standardize our e-discovery practices we had a case that really highlighted the need um, sort of as we deal with much more data in the institution to have sort of more modern um, modernized e-discovery sort of practices and resources and the case that presented that it really ultimately made sense to have basically a much bigger firm with different resources and expertise uh, mm -hmm. take take that on so it's it's always both and then you know finally some things are just like really specialized areas of law that we just don't have the expertise so one example is um, the city does a lot of telecom work um, but we don't have that really highly specialized expertise in house. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and thank you for highlighting the digitizing and e discovering. A lot of departments are ha having to do that. Um, is it putting a strain on the current staff, or did you have to hire more people to take on these projects? Um, well, in the particular case I'm talking about, we, we ended up having to turn to outside counsel midway through just because the wh where we stood and what these sort of like short-term obligations to sort of get our hands around a bunch of 
data and e-discovery obligations were. Um, but we've got the, our, our budget request that is in for fiscal 25 actually has embedded within it um, some work that we're taking out of that experience. Mm -hmm. So um, in our budget request, like we are, you know, one thing that it funds is a new position of somebody on our staff who's sort of our tech point person. Um, uh, a second thing that's funded within our outside council request for fiscal 25 is um, an, an outside lawyer who's working as a consultant to help us, advi like advising us on designing, um, documenting, and training ourselves on uh, e-discovery standard operating procedures. Um, so. And a lot of these are positions that already exist in private firms, but really trying to make sure that we're bringing the city to a more modern approach to how we do our municipal work. Um, even our legal operations analyst position, that's something that actively exists in other offices, but taking a look at what is the right fit and the right need that our municipal work requires. So making sure we're being a little bit more modern, a little bit more thoughtful as to how we're approaching our positions. And there must be more. I know when we had do it here, they talked about supporting all of the departments up dating systems and all, but there must be privacy issues also in your department where you're going to keep it in-house or if you contract it out, it's not. Yeah, yes. um, but do it is, like so as we work on um, our case management upgrade, do it uh, will actually be sort of our lead partner in that and um, their very sophisticated at working with, you know, sort of like whichever vendor we end up working with, uh, do it. Um, it's like very sophisticated in terms of dealing with like the whatever special privacy issues are going to arise. They've obviously, you know, worked on that. You know, there's privacy issues arise in other departments as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, and one sure. of the things we're, we're actually already working with Do It and the procurement team. Um, we are in the middle of putting together an RFI for that case management system because we want to make sure that we are aware of all the updates that have happened in case management systems, including privacy, including you know, accessibility for our different attorneys across different offices, to make sure we are, again, looking at the most modern approach to how we can do our work while keeping in mind all the privacy and, and uh, special considerations we need to have. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, just a quick question for Treasury. Um, on the slide where it talked about how you process over 120 million for current and 60, so it's like 50%. Do you see that percentage shifting, and what does that mean for the city? And so, as more retire, and yeah. I <laughs> well, I, again, we process the um, BRS payroll as well. So, I think the numbers are going to remain pretty consistent. The dollars are going to go up, mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I think the numbers will remain consistent. So I think the staff we have today will be more than able to process the um, the numbers. But yeah, it's it, it they're significant numbers, and that's why you know I say they're the nuts and bolts. Yeah, it's important, and I know Council of Flint said he likes to go visit. Maybe we can put in the budget to fix fix the escalators because <laughs> it's really hard to get down there and you have no windows I'd also advocate for upgrades I know age strong is like yeah. courted off because of asbestos down there so yeah. I do think upgrades to your space in that the basement would be, would be nice I would um, add I will advocate for that but thank you for all you do. escalators thank would you. be wonderful that would be great yeah, no yeah, reason a lot of, yeah, a lot of yeah all the things we can do but yeah <laughs> Elevators, we'll talk about that at a different hearing. <laughs> the escalators to the basement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilor Braden, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Good, Good to morning, see you all. Councilor. Um, I'm always blown away by the fact that you send out a million, um, a million letters. Or, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot of bills and a lot of postage. Yes, it is. Uh, one thing we're encountering, this is just an anecdote, like, um, I, was, I do office hours at um, <clears throat> Veronica Smith Senior Center. Seniors are bringing me their, their checks now. It's very, it's not a, a really an, a responsibility I don't want because they don't trust the mail to bring this, the check safely to City Hall mm -hmm. because they have these, these folks that are fishing the, oh, the, the, bill, the bills out of the, and taking people's checks and washing them. So 
Um, I know the, the police department are watching that, but it's really a sad state of affairs when our elders can't trust the post office to bring their real estate taxes to City Hall. Um, first of all, law department. <laughs> um, this is a question more about compliance. Um, to what extent do, does the government services team ensure that all city departments are aware of equipped to and well resourced to ensure internal compliance with all the statutes and ordinances of uh, all the different departments. Um, and then also, um, I'm curious about the legal department, I know all the departments that you're um, providing legal services for. I, we had a, a meeting with the, we had the planning department in here last week and we said, oh, the, the corporation council is going to be taking care of us. So uh, what will the, the structure of legal council for the planning department be? Uh, their attorneys are involved with development review and oversee all the contractual affordable housing uh, production agreements and the uh, community benefits agreements and corporation agreements with um, that we negotiate uh, to you know as mitigation for all the development that's happening so those are the two questions just you know in terms of just um, ensuring that departments are compliant with statutes of and municipal ordinances and then uh, your relationship with the new planning department when it comes in, when it arrives on July 1st. <laughs> okay. Um, in, in terms of compliance, and I would like to reserve the right after I go back and confer with people to give a better answer, because I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of stuff that different pieces of the team do mm -hmm. uh, that I will miss or that I'm not aware of. Um, but, you know, I, I will say two things. Um, first of all, uh, we are advisors and a little bit responsive, meaning um, it is not the law department's sort of among its sort of set tasks to do all trainings that all, you know, like 60, five or so departments and boards need to do for their various uh, types of workflow, right? So in terms of sort of proactively ensuring that sort of every piece of work complies with you know, some set, like uh, it's, it's not uh, our department's sort of so the, the departments would have their own their own policy manual or whatever that would be right. that we, they would reference yeah. for that. Yeah. Now, what would be our role is when a department is sort of asking, "Hey, you know, there's a new OSHA rule out. Mm -hmm. um, How does are that? we supposed to like? Is this to apply to municipalities?" <coughs> yeah. Um, that's absolutely our role is to work with each of our departmental clients uh, in support of um, sort of making sure that they understand their obligations and supporting them when they yeah. are sort of like rolling them out or laying yeah. them out. But let me reserve the right, if you don't mind, to give you a better answer if I go back upstairs. Yeah, and that's say, fine. Hey, that's, that's fine. And, and then what yeah. about and the planning department? Just to, sorry, just to follow up on that, we just make sure that we're aware of their obligations. And, you know, we attempt to counsel, we attempt to advise when they bring things to us. We often get kind of off-the-cuff questions as to like, hey, this is happening with an employee, this is happening with a specific policy, are we able to do this? Um, as part of their regular work, mm -hmm. uh, you know whether or not legal advice is legal advice, so whether yeah. or not departments follow that is up to yeah, them. That's part them. of our, our privilege of working with them. Um, but we want to make sure that we are always advising and having good relationships, so like that those questions do come to us more often than not, and as soon as possible, where there's still something that we can do to help. Yeah, very good. Um, in terms of the planning department, that's a great question because it's something we're currently working on, right? But uh, the the Basic answer is the attorneys that are currently at the BPDA will sort of live in the planning department, right? So I mentioned uh, in my overview, we've got certain departments that have such sort of like either big or specialized workflows that we have uh, a group kind of embedded there. Mm -hmm. um, that is certainly what is going to have to happen with the planning department. You mentioned some of them, right? They have a level of so uh, specialism that sort specialization of specialization and, and, and sort of real estate and development expertise that we don't have in the law department. 
So it's like a natural fit to have them become essentially another, uh, you know, sort of office like that. They will be advising what is now a city department. So in that sense, uh, it will come, you know, sort of under and in connection with the corporation council. Um, but, in, you know, one, one last thing, I'll, it's still a little bit of a unique transfer of employees. So those employees are going to be transferring directly into the planning department yeah. and going to be funded. And I'm sure I know that this uh, committee and this body's heard a lot about um, the funding structure, right? Those employees are going to sort of stay kind of in the same situation yeah. with the BPDA's transfer to the city sort of making up so you won't see in our uh, budget request for this year uh, anything to do with the new planning department even though there are going to be a number of lawyers uh, a few of them are going to stay I believe as BPDA employees um, and there is still yeah. a legal entity yeah. to be advised um, but we uh, are working out uh, there's a variety of sort of like professional responsibility things yeah. about how you advise across organizations, which we are allowed to Thank do. Thank you. I have other questions and my time is running out. <laughs> I'm going to jump to the next <laughs> thing. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, thank you. Um, this is for Treasury, just collecting on revenue. Um, the, um, the state legislature had previously granted home rule petitions requesting that cit uh, cities uh, by the requested by certain certain cities that they could would be authorized to replace municipal lien charge liens on properties for unpaid fines for non municipal violations uh, you know so Lowell Somerville and Framingham I'm just wondering this maybe applies to law department as well what is the involvement of the law and the tr law department treasury department enforcing ordinances because uh, I know we had this conversation about liens and when we sent our home rule petition up about increasing our fines, we wanted to include liens, but we were told to take it out because it wasn't um, appropriate. Um, and what is the current workflow with um, Suffolk County Registry of Deeds with regard to obtaining accurate and up-to-date property ownership data? Like I know that's part of the reason why we, the courts have said we can't put liens on because we don't necessarily have up-to-date ownership data um, on the books. Um, oh, that's the story we're getting, anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, we put liens on every year, every delinquent parcel. The addresses come from the assessor's office, mm -hmm. and they get um, updates, I think it's once a month, from the Registry of Deeds, the new ownership date um, information. So the city, you know, your um, the assessor's office has accurate information, and you folks get that from the... So there's no, there's no really reason why we, we shouldn't be able to put liens for code violations on persistent uh, persistent uh, offenders when it comes to um, code violations. You know, just as fines and liens, um, that's more of a question for the law department. Anyway, we can get back to that. Okay. I, I realize I've run out of time and I have lots more questions, but I have to leave at 11.30, I'll be back. I'll go, go away and come back again. Okay. I just want to acknowledge that Council Santana has joined us. Um, now we'll go to Council Mejia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all. It's good to good see morning. you. Thank good you, to see you. Um, so because we only have eight minutes, uh, Adam, I'm going to ask very specific questions, and I want to try to get in as much as I can, OK? Um, you had mentioned there's over 180 claims thus far for this year, and I'm just curious, high level, kind of what's the theme? What, what types of claims are we seeing? Uh, Council, I don't have that in front of me. Okay, so I mean, we can a lot get of it that. is like mm -hmm. potholes, damage to automobiles. That's sort of the bulk ordinarily, but I don't have statistics, but I'm happy to follow. Yeah, it would be great to, to kind of get a gauge of what people are claiming. Um, so I always ask who is overseeing the overseer <laughs> and I'm curious in terms of the work that you all are doing kind of what's the quality control around that like are there folks who come in and audit and, and review the law department and your rulings and like who helps inform or at least make sure that there is a level of quality. Yeah. Um, I would say that 
that is the in in the first instance is the job of um, people who work in management and supervisory roles within the department right their their job is to sort of check in on their team's work mm -hmm. make sure that it's timely make sure that it's like of a, of a good quality um, I'm talking natural... specifically about like e higher yeah. like I'm gonna go to a very specific example in terms of communication um, and this has already happened so it is what it is and it's public but during redistricting we did not get notified as city councilors to participate at least that I know of and when I think about quality control and when I think about your role in protecting and serving, I believe you were also the council, right, or no? Yes. Okay, right. So just curious about that type of <laughs> dynamic in terms of whether or not we can say with confidence that there is a level of, of compliance in terms of making sure that we have the highest level of service deliverable to everyone that you are supposed to represent. Yeah, um, I, I understand the question and I, you know, sort of looking back to that specific example, um, I will just say um, in that particular case, we actually did use outside counsel because it required a level of specialized expertise that we did not have within the department. Um, in consultation with, and like within the advice of that expert outside counsel, made uh, you know strategic decisions about the best way to defend the city. Um, and I, I understand that you know people could have different um, opinions about how the case should have been litigated. Um, in terms of the specific o oversight of that, I don't have a, a clear, you know, additional layer to to offer. Um, and obviously, people are free to sort of mm -hmm. look at our work, which is done fairly publicly. And um, it has has the law department been audited for their, you know, for the work? Um, no, counselor. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm curious in regards to conflict conflict of interest, right? In, in terms now, I know Councilor Braden has asked specifically with the planning department moving into the mix and the role that you guys will play. I'm still unclear what role would your department play in the planning and development department, if any? The, the planning department will be a city of Boston department. And will you be providing legal input and yes. feedback? Okay, so the reason why I ask this question is because right now there is a um, sentiment in terms of like who oversees the overseer, right? Like who, who are we here to represent? And so as you continue to navigate these conversations, I'm curious what standards are you gonna be holding yourself to to ensure that always the best interest of the public is the decisions that are being made on behalf of the taxpayers? Um, well, I think that you actually just articulated the standard perfectly and um, that is, the that is the standard that is the standard that and i'm not even a I, lawyer <laughs> not. uh that that's the standard that i seek to obtain and um and how are we that's... going to know whether or not you are meeting that I mean, just to step in, all of our attorneys are licensed and we are, mm -hmm. and they are, sorry, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> and our team is overseen by the Massachusetts Board of Overseers and we take that responsibility very serious. Um, we'll often have conversations in the office of, you know, what is the ethical thing to do? What is the right thing to do here? Uh, what is, we take the licensees very serious because, you know, if there is a revocation of a license, that is an attorney's career mm -hmm. gone. Right. Um, and all those years of schooling and practice 
completely mm -hmm. going away. Yeah. The reason why I'm, these questions are coming up is mm -hmm. because there is a sentiment that you know we are not meeting the needs of our constituents or that there's always some funny money or business, not money, funny. <laughs> there's just, there's a lack of trust in city government, specifically around transparency. And I think it's really important as we continue to have these conversations that we are able to articulate specifically how we're gonna hold ourselves to a standard. And that that standard should be um, co-designed alongside you know, other folks, right? So that there's a level of integrity in the process. And I do appreciate Pilar's definition. And I'm just curious around efficiency. Um, and this is gonna go to, I, I know I have one minute left. I'm gonna go to my good friend, Maureen, and I'll come back with more questions for your department. But just to share the, the wealth here. I'm curious around efficiencies, right? There's a lot of departments that, you know, we have and, does your office ever play a role in kind of auditing departments, efficiencies, dollars? Like, do you do any of that? Or, and if not you, then who? Thank you. Um, no, we don't, we don't prefer, perform um, internal audits. We do have um, partners in the audit department who, you know, we engage external auditors to do some audits. Um, we do ongoing oversight, so for cash operations and those types of things, we do work with the departments to ensure um, that, you know, they're making their deposits timely, all those types of things, and then we work with our partners in the, on the audit team with regard to external audits. Yeah, it, I'd be curious, I know, Chair, that my time is up, but just so you all, I, I'd like to know who are those partners? Who are the folks like outside that you're contracting with? How much money we're spending on that? It would just be helpful to have a clear sense sure. of what that looks like. Sure, I can, I can talk to the audit department because that's, we, we use external auditors, KPMG, et cetera, there's mm -hmm. a couple, so I yep. can get those numbers for you. It would you, be Chair. helpful just to, to know. And I know we have a second round. Yes, we will have a second round. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilor Fitzgerald, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel uh, for coming today. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, the, the real estate, personal property, excise taxes, things of that nature, uh, makes up for what percentage of our city budget? Do we know? Um, I think it's 77%. 77, so all those make up 77% of our budget. Um, do we collect a boat excise tax still? Um, we do. We do? We do, okay. yearly. Um, we actually have a mailing going out um, in June. Was there ever a time where it stopped around COVID or anything? Because some, some folks have said that uh, you know, it stopped and are they, are they starting that back up again and that's a revenue stream we might not be collecting on, but I just want to make sure yes, we... Yes, we are starting it up again. Um, they were an issue of mooring permits um, back during COVID, and then we get a file also from the state, the state environmental, and they send us a file, and they didn't send one during COVID either. So we're kind of trying to get caught up now to okay, our great. plan now, yeah, because the moorings were just opened, the website just opened, and we're now in the process of mailing excise bills. So this, is this the first year that it's No, back? yeah, we mailed it last year. Okay. Last year we did it also. And, and yeah. collected on it and as well? And then we collected on it, yeah. There's okay. not that many. I mean, there's like 1,200 bills in the file. Okay. That's, we do mail them out. Great. Thank you. Um, I know you guys collect for uh, the bids. Um, so for in District 3, the new market bid, mm -hmm. how do we feel that's doing? Are we, everyone cooperating, everyone contributing? Uh, yes, yes. We have um, a very high collection rate with them. Actually. Okay. We, say, we collect probably 97% of the money they commit to us. Great. And we pay them out quarterly. So at the end of every quarter, we um, create a, um, data for them, send them the data, and then wire them the money. So they're up to the 90s in their collections. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Adam, for, for council, I know 25.1% is outside council. Do we know that in dollar amounts? What that what what twenty five point one is of the whole, not there. Yeah. It, for well, for the fiscal twenty five request, that is 
it's essentially 2.1 million. You know, there's a little bit of, that's the contracted services line. Okay. Um, there are a few sort of small and very important other contracts in there, but just, you know, I think to, for clarity, let's just call it 2.1. The majority is outside council, but there's a couple of dollars in there for other contracts. Exactly. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and this is a larger question. It doesn't necessarily have to have a, 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 an immediate answer, but I just wonder your thoughts of what would be the ramifications if we were to tax non-essential goods, right? Because is that, do we, do we know how much that would bring in or what, what, are, the, what are the pros and cons of that? Wait, sorry, can you? Is there, like, do we have a tax on non-essential goods at the moment, the city? I'm gonna turn to my colleagues and collect it. Yeah. Must know. Sorry, yeah, no, this might be going back. You're right, I went, yeah. I went back well, to. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what you would mean by that, but I, my answer overarchingly would be no. Right, but, yeah. right. I mean, I, I can also add in, we just have our sort of defined statutory categories. Right. So if Her, there's, yeah. Yeah. isn't it non-essential goods such, I mean, there's, you know, yachts, boats, jewelry, dining, things that would be considered non-essential or, or luxury yeah, items. Don't. Do we, we don't, I don't think there's a tax on those oh, no, at the no, moment, no, right? No. If we were to look into tax. that, what would be the pros and cons of looking at taxing non-essential items? Like is there, you know, do we think? Do we know how much that would bring in if we were to do that? Did we ever run the numbers of saying there's, there's some money out there that could be brought in? I'm thinking about this doesn't necessarily hit the, the, the residents as much, but for the folks coming in, tourists, dining out, buying things in the yeah. city, things like that. Yeah, I don't, it, I don't think it's ever been vetted, to be yeah, honest. I, I'm yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah. I mean, I know we, you know, we have a mails tax, we have, yeah. you know, um, yep. room occupancy yeah. tax, those types of things, but no, as far as that, I am not aware. Yeah, that I, has been, I the numbers have been wrong. Yeah, no, I just, it, it, I think it's just, um, as we're looking at, you know. For new revenue. In, it, for new revenue, yeah. and especially when times of, right, when we know that the, the uh, a lot of uh, assessments of property are going down and we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, forecasting probably less money than, we, than we've had in the past over the next sort of five years. Um, how do we sort of make up that difference so cuts don't need to be made? Mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, I, I would advise that we, we at least start to look into that path. I don't know if it, again, that's what, okay. I, I'm unfamiliar with the pros and cons. I'm not an economist and I'm not sure of like what that, well, John, here's the downside of that, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, and so um, I just wonder if the good outweighs the bad with that. Okay. I think it's yeah, an interesting to revenue stream into. to yep. attack. Um, with that, I'll give back the rest of my time, Chair, and thank you very much to oh, the panel. thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Council Weber, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, th thank you to the panelists. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an attorney. Uh, I've litigated cases uh, against the city of Boston, both the in-house and outside counsel. I also work for the Attorney General's Office in the Administrative Law Division, so I know what it's like to represent agencies. Um, so, of course, I'll start with Treasury. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, I just I had a question, uh, and maybe you don't know this. Uh, it's, I, I don't. I'm not sure. Do you, do you know anything about rental registration fees and our collection of those? Um, well, I do know that that's that's done through um, ISD. ISD. So, okay. Yeah, I would. Um, you know, we could get back to you with what the numbers are and, and collection rates, but yeah, it's all processed through um, ISD. Okay. Yeah, it would be great to. Uh, I'd like to know how many units we're collecting from and, and what the number is, uh, the total. That would be great. Um, thank you. Uh, law department. <laughs> um, so I, I just, I had a question about, you know, what goes into the decision to choose outside counsel or litigate something? Um, and yeah, so I'd just like to hear, you know, how, how you go about making that decision when you get a new case. Yeah. Um... I mean, it's essentially, right, do we know how to do this? Uh, do we have a conflict? And do we have the capacity? Um, different outside counsel tends to work with different teams, right? So our, our litigation team, um, I 
I would say utilizes the majority of our, our outside counsel sort of like in connection with the litigation team's docket. That's my experience. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, right, that's, you know, first and foremost, like that, that team is making an assessment of what they can sort of do in house. Um, and when they think that they don't have either the, on the litigation side, oftentimes it's the capacity um, for a, a conflict issue. Sometimes there's a specialization question, but um, sometimes the specialization question arises like outside of litigation too. Um, and then um, they sort of go from there. Uh, we have, you know, there is uh, a lot of continuity uh, over many years in um, which outside counsel we have used, and I understand that um, there are drawbacks to that, but there are also real advantages in terms of efficiency and knowledge of our institution and having people who uh, know and have worked with the departments and officials who they're going to be working with and um, representing and um, putting on a case. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and so do you know, we're talking about 25% of the, I guess the budget, 2.1 million, primarily going to outside council. Do you know how that compares to other cities, uh, other corporation y council? Y yes. Um, he, our overall budget is, I will characterize it as efficient uh, when measured against uh, the budgets for other municipal law departments. And I think that holds true whether you're looking at similarly sized cities. Um, there we, you know, like for example, like Portland, Oregon, or you know, looking around for places that have comparable budgets and populations. Although, of course, it's a little hard to know for sure whether we are tasked with the same things. Uh, but that also holds true if you look regionally, where we're dealing with different size cities, but we know that we're tasked with similar things because we're dealing with like similar legal structures. So if you look at like Cambridge, Somerville, Newton, Brookline, or, um, you know, whether you measure it like the, the law department budget as a percentage of overall budget, we're very efficient, uh, judged that way. Um, and then w when it comes to outside council budget, I would say essentially the same thing. Uh, it's a little hard, like going through other municipalities' budgets to understand, you know, for example, ours appears in a line called contracted services. We know that that's primarily outside council. So it's a little hard going through other budgets to know exactly what you're looking at, but um, the, it's usually sort of evident in the same way that ours is, looking through budgets, and m measured that way against sort of other cities in the region. Um, our use is, again, I would say efficient. Yeah, so, uh, so the 2.1 million, does that all go to hourly services, or, or do, do we have law firms on retainer that it's, we pay? It's almost all hourly. Um, we don't have law firms on retainer, um, but in fiscal 25, there's a few areas where we're trying to explore like a flat rate um, for, you know, work that we can sort of describe in a flat rate process just so we can, you know, understand going into it what the costs are going to be and whether we think it's like a good investment for the department. So, but but the majority yeah. is still our. And and for those, just, oh sorry. sorry. Just to kind of give you a little bit of a comparison, like Baltimore has a population that's about, uh, let's say, a hundred thousand smaller than than the city of Boston. Their city budget usually is around four point one billion compared to our around. Well, actually, pretty comparable to the, to the city of Boston. And they actually for their contractual services again. Every department kind of, or every city uses their legal department slightly different, um, but they're looking at 5.7 million. So, pretty different from our 2.1 that we have. Um, okay, and uh, I guess, do you know? 
I, you know, I just I, I had the uh, I worked on the Smith case, the police lieutenant's case. You know, the city hired outside counsel. I think it was Stone and Chandler capably represented the city. Uh, but do you know how much the city? Sp I, I don't expect you to have this number. But do you ha have? Do you know how much the city spent on that case? It was like a six-year uh, litigation that it had two trials and two appeals to the first circuit. And uh, I do not have that in front of me, but okay. I can get you that information. That, that would be great. Um, uh, and so, I, 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 are we using outside counsel on the Satanic Temple case? I, I saw that in the. Uh, in we the are notes. not. We're not. Okay. And do you, I, I, we had oral argument, or you did, uh, the, the, the law department did. Are, are you, regardless of the merits, are you expecting that to go to, for them to seek cert in the Supreme Court, or regardless of the decision? It's, I'm not, I, I don't need to put you on the you record. Know what? But. Uh, I, I don't. Um, I don't want to predict uh, what they will do. I think that you know, not. I can't speak for them. Uh, obviously, I think a lot of it will depend on what the First Circuit does and what the decision oh. says, and then they will have to evaluate, and we will just have to react to that. I'm just, just one follow up. So it, it just if it, if. God forbid, you know, no, no, no pun intended. Uh, uh, it goes up to the, to the Supreme Court. Would we engage outside counsel, or you know, or would you, would we continue to represent uh, the, the law department? Would continue to litigate it. Um, you know, again, I don't want to make would you, that decision now, but I can, I can yeah. share a different piece of information with you that I think will be responsive without. Um, making decisions that you know I would need to make in consultation with my team and sort of both understanding things that I don't understand about um, who's done how much in what area already on the case um, but I will just share with you that you know obviously the city had another case go to the Supreme Court we were represented by outside counsel in that case um, and um, there is certainly a level of expertise in the Supreme Court bar that I, I we do not totally, have in house. I totally agree. You know, <laughs> everyone when they, if they, you know, master, the AG's office, you know, they'll they'll use they, now they have a solicitor uh, a general or solicitor's office, but most uh, places because it's such a highly specialized environment would. Uh, would it, I'm not, just no yeah. slight to the law. But oh, even, even in that case, let our attorney still yeah. partnered with yeah. outside counsel. Let, let me be really clear. Like, I just don't want to commit to a decision because it's something that I would need to make in consultation with but, my team. But you will, you that will. That being said, I don't, there's no shame in acknowledging that that is a bar that involves a level of specialized expertise um, that we don't have in house. And I, I yeah. Absolutely, I acknowledge that, and I don't. Yeah. There's no shame in us sort of understanding where other people have expertise that we clearly do not. Yeah, just for my colleagues, and I'll just there is a Supreme Court bar of basically people who clerked on this for Supreme Court judges who hang, you know, who specialize in just Supreme Court cases, and people engage them when they have a case in the Supreme Court. So I, I just I didn't I don't want to suggest that. You're not up to the up to standard. It's everyone no. in the country relies on these special. And our staff attorney did still appear yeah. before. Oh yeah. 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 Anyway, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Santana. The floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, good morning. Thank you for, to the administration for being here. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for asking amazing questions. Um, I have just two questions. Um, one for Treasury and then one kind of for both, and I don't even know if you can actually even answer that one. But, um, you know, first, um, great to see you, Maureen, and just want to give you, um, you know, your team um, a shout out, um, in particular, uh, Margaret um, Dyson, who's just been an incredible um, resource here to the city of Boston, and I've worked very closely today. Um, just tremendous individual um, and very professional. Um, so I just want to say thank you on that end. Um, I've done work with Margaret and, and, and with your department on, you know, identifying um, different grants that the city can um, potentially partner with and, 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 and give out to residents and to community. Um, can you just kind of speak to, to that, if there's any um, 
future plans or maybe pockets of money that we're not looking at in the city <laughs> uh, where we could create more grants for community. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah. Th thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So Margaret Dyson is the director of the trust section and um, Margaret is constantly looking for opportunities to get the money out the door and work, you know, work with the community, <clears throat> work with ONS at the time. Um, so we have made great strides. Um, I think when, when Margaret first, you know, joined the team, the money wasn't getting out, you know, it wasn't, and it certainly wasn't getting out, you know, as quickly as it should or to the constituents that it should. I, I'm, I'm proud to say that is happening. You know, Margaret is um, working as, and constantly looking for any bucket that isn't. You know, it, some of it's a, a difficult because some of these trusts were left to us, you know, in the 1900s, so it, it's not applicable today. Um, you know, some of it is, you know, $5 to buy your school book, and I think I'm making that up, but, but you get the point, yep. right? You can't buy a book for $5 anymore. So we're, we're looking for ways to consolidate where we can and, and make the money, you know, useful for the people. So that's a constant. Um, and, and you know those we are looking under those rocks continuously and, and an additional um, opportunity is is the community preservation team um, giving out grants um, to the constituencies as well absolutely no I only ask that question because I think it often goes on notice of uh, that that work happens within your department and just wanted to uplift that and the work, great work that you're doing in any way that my office can uplift um, and support that um, count on us Thank you, um, my next question is kind of to both departments, and, and, and this is kind of a tricky one. I'm not sure um, if you if you all can answer it, but it's in regards to pilot, um, and you know, obviously it's a voluntarily program for our universities and nonprofits. Um, to the law, law department, what's the pathway to making that a, a legal requirement? Um, and then to the treasury department, um, it may, you may not have this. In front of you, and I don't know if you if you administer these in terms of like all the colleges or you know all, all the organizations who are paying, who the ones that are not paying, do we have that data um, readily accessible, um, not just to us but also to the community? So, so we certainly have the data of who's you know who's contributing what. Yes, um, so that we can provide. And is that public to to like residents as well, or is it just kind of an internal? I don't know the answer to that, Councilor, okay. but I can find that out. Thank you. Um, with respect to pilot, I will say, I know that there's a, been ongoing and continued work uh, within our finance cabinet to really, you know, you know, continue formalizing um, and really getting, you know, real commitment and participation in pilot from our nonprofit institutions. So I don't really, you know, I think that's the path. Um, obviously, it is state law that makes these institutions exempt from property taxes and makes this a pilot scheme rather than a tax scheme. So, uh, you know, it's it's state law. So the pathway is changing the, changing the law is for years. Or <laughs> or continuing the, the you know continuing and advancing part, right. the work that the finance cabinet has done over many years to really bring a lot of these institutions into a different relationship than I think existed years ago. Absolutely no, and I I I don't want to undermine that and the work um, that so many um, people have done to get us to this point. I also just I ask that question because I think there's a sense of urgency. Um, especially with the uh, where the city is in 2024, um, and um, you know, I think there's there's been a lot of conversation on the council about it as well, and um, so that's why I asked. But really appreciate that. Um, again, appreciate the work that both departments are doing, um, and I'll um, yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. Um, I just have a couple questions. Um, I know there are some boundaries to hiring legal counsel at departments. Uh, Fair Housing testified at the hearing that they could use an in-house attorney. What might be an obstacle to that? And would we actually fund that through the law department line item rather through Fair Housing? Um, yes. Uh, I think that 
about, I don't know exactly when this was, but call it seven to ten years ago, um, the, the city made an effort to um, sort of make sure that attorneys who were practicing law and representing the city were technically connected to the law department, just because that's sort of what our ordinance calls for. Um, so um, I, I don't know about the specific co conversation you're referring to, but when we place an attorney in a department, if they're going to be representing um, the city of Boston, like representing us in any uh, incident or, you know, practicing law, um, you know, in keeping with that structure, um, over the last, whatever it is, seven to 10 years, we tried to connect that attorney to the law department. There are obviously many people who are attorneys working for the city of Boston, doing you know, lots of work uh, and bringing their legal expertise and skill to benefit that work. Um, but you know, technically, they're usually not uh, sort of practicing and representing the city. So. But I don't, you know, as for the specific conversation, I'm not uh, up to speed on it, so I don't want to sort of opine too definitively. I don't know what the you know, specific discussion was. Yep, no, it sounded like you answered yeah. the question. And when we have a settlement, what fund do we pay out of? Is this the execution of court? Yes. All right. Um, uh, sorry, a uh, little, little correction. Um, okay. Sometimes uh, in a settlement in the employment context mm -hmm. uh, will pay out of a department's personnel budget because a portion of the settlement or all of the settlement is a, is a wages payment. I see that. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to write that down. Um, and then how do we budget for execution of court? And I, I just asked that because when we're looking at that budget, um, we see that budget going from, you know, the actual in 2022, 34 million, the actual in 23, 32 million, um, but then in FY25, uh, we're budgeting for $5 million. So how do we actually budget? Yeah. Um, I cannot speak directly to that because the OBM uh, actually sort of figures that out. Um, I believe, though, that so. So I, I, I honestly would have to defer to OBM on describing how they make that choice. Um, but uh, I do know that OBM. Um, looks at the history of payouts over time and make sure that like, regardless of how it's budgeting it make sure that makes sure that they are thinking about future years likely liability as well mm -hmm. and uh, if they're not putting it in execution of courts um, finding a way to build in a little bit of flexibility so that if execution of courts goes up um, they have something that's not already uh, like unalterably committed somewhere else. So that, that's all like, you know, I'm not really an expert on that, but uh, I do know that they're not setting that number each year without looking at reality and history. Interesting. And um, I think you just answered it. So it's paid over time, the, the settlements, or they lump sum or a combination of both? The majority are lump sum. Okay. And can I get a list of the payments we owe over time going forward? Y yes. Uh, I just don't like have that in front of me, okay. but I will, we, we can do so. Yeah, and I just want the numbers, right? So that mm -hmm. we're protecting um, the privacy. Um, I think that is all of my, oh, my last question is, the contracting. Um, I see that we don't contract a lot out to MWBEs um, because of time sensitivity. What are we doing going forward to build, you know, relationships so that way we can contract with MWBEs? 
Thank you for that question. I'm going to ask Ms. Ortiz to weigh in in a second because she's actually been doing a lot of work on this front. But I, um, but before we get to that, I just want to note one uh, thing. I think I think you're right. Um, for better or for worse, oftentimes we're making you know decisions you know on a compressed time frame. Um, many law firms, right, our partnership, like there's a lot of like the bigger or even medium-sized firms, because of the makeup of the legal community in Boston, um, tend to like obviously not qualify as an MBE mm -hmm. or WBE, mm -hmm. partly just because it's not 51% of their partnership. Right. Um, one thing that you know we have, you know, in speaking to other cities and stuff, learned and you know believed to be true is that there is value in sort of thinking about who the originating partner is. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to some, you know, understanding and, you know, I want to turn to Ms. Ortiz in a second, um, you know, the need to be more forward looking and, and work on, you know, bringing in more MBEs and WBEs. Uh, we are trying to be uh, thoughtful about who the originating partners are at law firms. And by that metric, we're doing a little bit better, you know, you know, over sort of big contracts over the past year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sort of over half of the originating partners or half were women, uh, including a woman of color. So obviously it's not the end of our work by any stretch, but I didn't want to note that before yeah. turning over to well. yeah. so, I mean, you Sorry, can you, can you present us with those, can you provide those numbers of the originating? Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just to, I mean, you all understand the importance of being out in the community, meeting people, and having those connections. A lot of what we've done in the last two years has been making sure that, you know, we are reaching out to the right groups where MW, MWBE potential uh, firms are, uh, making sure that we are meeting people, learning what their expertise are, learning where they work, learning, you know, what the makeup is of their firm, and kind of keeping that almost like a, I mean, I'm a little maybe too young to make the reference to Rolodex, but like keeping that Rolodex going of, you know, what are the people that we can reach out to when the time does come, when we do have a tight, tight frame. You know, when we're looking at them, when the moment is, uh, is before us, it's almost too late. So the fact that we're doing this proactively and kind of keeping, and I try to go to as many things as possible, and we try to send as many attorneys uh, as possible to different events to make sure that they're making those connections. And as we make those connections, we can kind of keep a roster so that, you know, a case comes up in real estate, we have somebody that's outside of our regular roster of outside counsel to work with. Uh, so it's really, it's an ongoing conversation and ongoing uh, just collaboration with our community. Thank you. Um, now I'll go to my council colleagues for second round of questions. Um, Council Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, thank you to the administration team that is here. Adam, I was, I was curious, does the city of Boston partner or, or hire a, an insurance company for any potential settlements down the road? Do we have insurance for any type of legal action impacting the city on, on, on major cases? If the city lost a case, it was and had to pay $50 million, does the city come up with that $50 million payment, or do we, all, do we have insurance on that? The city is self-insured, so. S say it again. The city's self-insured, so uh, if we lost a case of that magnitude, uh, the city of Boston would have to come up with the money. With the money. No, no outside assistance from any any insurance companies. No. And where would that where would that money come from? Um, where where would that fifty so, million dollars come from? So for, I mean, that gets I think it gets back to Chair Worrell's question, right? If um, for a for a judgment of that magnitude, um, one hopefully we would be able to see it coming down the pipe somewhat, right? Um, we do uh, meet quarterly with the finance cabinet to 
to sort of go over um, the cases with high potential liability, mm -hmm. uh, as well as sort of where we think they are in the life cycle, um, right, to, to have exactly this kind of conversation um, about sort of how we would, you know, when they might be, you know, when the finance team potentially could have to come up with those sums of money. Um, and that's a kind of planning that they do within the year and sort of out into the future. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation and analysis that is also sort of forced by and embedded within um, the city's audits and credit rating uh, reporting. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of thing that you're asking about and the kind of thing the chair is asking about is the kind of thing, obviously, that um, lenders, uh, in this case, you know, people who would buy the city's debt are mm -hmm. very interested in and that our auditors have to sort of include as a portion of the city's um, standard audit. Uh, so. Well, let, let me ask this. Um, has there been any settlements that the city entered into that were significant in terms of a large dollar figure? Yes. Give, I mean, give, give me the um, figures that... I'll, I'll give this, you an example. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm, are we talking a couple million bucks? Are we talking a couple hundred thousand in bucks? 20, no, sir. Um, in 20, I would say in early 2021, the city settled a matter for $16 million. Um, so uh, that's obviously a huge sum of money. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, g going forward, are we looking at any potential settlements such as a $16 million settlement maybe maybe in the next couple of years? Are we, are we on track to pay that type of figure? And if so, what plans are we making to, to deal with that? So I don't, I, I, I don't want to answer the first part of that question because um, if there was a case where there were ongoing settlement discussions, uh, I don't know you know, what, what the, you know, A, we wouldn't offer sort of publicly what we'd valued it at, and, and B, I don't know where the negotiation would go. Um, but what, what I can say is this. Um, there are a number of pending cases that have um, significant financial, like the potential of significant financial liability. Um, for the city. In the $16 million uh, range? Uh, I don't know, I don't want to sort of characterize it in that range because I don't think so. That being said, um, these are cases where, you, you know, there are cases, you don't need a case to be $16 million because if you have a bunch of cases that are a million dollars, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that uh, so without trying to, I don't, I don't want to sort of set parameters for litigants on the other side, um, but I do think it's fair to acknowledge that there are um, a number of cases uh, in the, the city that have liabilities, like potential liabilities that are into the millions, um, such that it's an ongoing sort of planning conversation that we are having with the Office of Budget Management and the CFO's office um, to sort of make sure they're sort of aware of these cases, we can talk about sort of what and is we that, can do in the timing. Is that to settle the case so the case goes away or to acknowledge wrongdoing or just to move on? Sorry, um, let, me, let me take a step back. When, we, when I'm talking about the liability, the liability could be coming through a settlement or through mm -hmm. um, bringing it all the way through either summary judgment in their favor or trial and us losing. So uh, the, the liability 
doesn't have to come from a settlement. It's sort of, it can come in a variety of ways in mm. litigation, uh, but all of those ways uh, can end up with the city being obligated to make a significant payment, so they all are part of that conversation. In terms of the, the reasons for settling, uh, I think that you've kind of accurately captured some of the reasoning, but I'd say for us, the, the touchstone really, because there's so many sort of, there's so many reasons to do something, for us the touchstone really is um, the use of taxpayer funds, right? So for us the touchstone is essentially what is the expected cost to the city of continuing versus the settlement that can be achieved. And, and when you do settle or there is a settlement reached or there's, a, or there's some type of an agreement in court, does the law department publicly inform the, the, the residents about what just took place or is that not disclosed? Um, we do not sort of affirmatively advertise or anything, but it is public. Uh, our settlement agreements are, are all public and we routinely produce them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just want to again say thank you to the administration team for being here for the important work that they're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Council. you, Council. Thank you. Council Braden, the floor is yours. Um, this is more of a financial management treasury question. Um, um, I'm really getting into looking at capital, look, capital plans and how they're not really what we are uh, what we're approving in the city budget is uh, not the specific items on the list, but actually just uh, the uh, authorizing the encumbering the debt. So um, the capital budget loan orders, the, the city's five-year capital plan involves issuance and incurrence of debt, but our financial management practices do not specify in the loan order the dollar amount to be expended per capital project and on what timeline it would be spent. So that, as a district councillor, I'm always interested. Don't get very excited. We're going to get some money for something, and then it never gets spent. So it's sort of very sort of deflating after a while. Um, how do our capital financial management processes compare with what's generally accepted as um, accounting principles with regard to capital planning? So I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, Councillor Braden, but um, what I will say is that the capital plan is predominantly managed um, by OBM. There's a, um, a budget um, team that works on the capital plan, and then we work in concert with them and the CFO's office to go out and you know seek the bonding, et cetera, to, to do that. Yeah. So, I, I, I'm yeah, not I'm probably not talking to the right person, <laughs> but OBM. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's just one of those quirky things that you know we're just trying to figure out. Like, uh, we we understand the encumbering the debt piece of it, but we don't understand how the capital plan is executed on a timeline, and and then we we sort of know stage by stage by stage how much of the money has been spent on that particular. Like, I know. In other, I know at the, at the state level they have, if the stages of a capital project and they say it's, you know, they have it, all of it documented stage by stage by stage and then you sort of know where you're at in terms of um, what's going to happen. When your when you're expected yeah. uh, project's going to actually arrive in your district. I would defer to the budget team on that because I, I'm sure they could answer those questions because they're intimate with that. Yeah, very good, thank you. Um, and then the other thing, uh, again, it might not be a, a question for you, but um, the component units uh, in are separate, legally separate organizations from, for which the city is fiscally accountable. And some of their financial statements are reported as if they're part of the city. So the BPHC, BPDEA, BPL, uh, but then BP, um, um, BPL is, BPS, sorry, is formally within the city. Um, and I'm just wondering in terms of the city's oversight capacity, 
over the financial management of all these component units. Um, um, what, do, what is the city's oversight role in terms of uh, the component units, these different departments, BPHC, BPDA, BPL, but then also what about, um, what's your financial oversight over BPS, Boston Public Schools? So I'll speak a little bit to what I know. Um, that's done through the auditing department, but um, I'll speak to the fact that the trusts are a component unit. So we, we work individually and create our financials, but we work in concert with the auditing department, and then they consolidate. So I, I believe that's the same for BPHC and BPL and BPDA. Mm -hmm. BPS is, if you will, another city department. So they're in the same tax ID number, and um, so really much more ingrained into our normal financial reporting processes. Yeah. But auditing could give you a better response than what I just gave you, but I think yeah. conceptually that's, that's how I see it. That's good, thank you. Uh, and then the other area is federal grants requires restringent reporting requirements under uniform guidance, uh, and the city is no longer considered low risk due to the amount that we receive. We receive hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Um, we are responsible for sub-recipient monitoring, so where the money is, passes through our different departments to others. Uh, some departments, like the Mayor's Office of Housing, have better financial controls than others. Uh, BPS aids strong in emergency management. Um, I'm just wondering, do we provide central uh, ANF administrative services across the enterprise to support those different departments in terms of timely reporting and accurate reporting on the sub-recipients? So uh, again, I'll, I'll speak, that, that is done through the auditing department, um, and there is a whole grants unit that um, does work with the various departments and does, again, one of the questions that Councillor Mejia had with regard to like the audit, they have um, single audits that come in and, and work with them and do make, ensure the compliance for all sub-recipient reporting, et cetera. So the audit department is on top of that, has a unit and works with the, with the varying departments. Just off the top of your head, do you, do you know how, how big the audit department is? How big the auditing department is? Um, my goodness, <laughs> maybe like 50 people. Yeah, I'm I, I just yeah. guessing something because you have they they have accounts payable, they have the central payroll team, they have an accounting team, and they have the grants monitoring team. So it's it's a good sized team. Okay, very good. Um, um, I think I just really want to thank you for the incredible work you do, like um, bringing the money in and spending it and that, this, this making sure it's, it's really uh, uh, the wheels of the bus. So I really appreciate all your great work and, and thank you. And thank you, um, uh, Attorney Cedarbaum, this morning and, and Pilar. Um, Thank you. I think that's that's all the questions I have. Oh, thank you, Council. Thank, thank, thank you. I believe up next is Council Mejia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And I'm going to take everyone's time that they yield. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just wanted to start off again with just really thanking Maureen. Like, it's been great to serve with you on the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust um, and get to learn a little bit more about your work and um, all that amazing you know, decisions that we make. And one of the things that I really appreciate about your role and your voice there is really always making sure that we have the right checks and balances, right? And like, are we uh, making sure that no one's gonna come after us and be like, no, right? So I really do appreciate that level of thought um, and just, you always like second motion I and I always <laughs> waiting to that. So it's been great to build a relationship with you. Same here. Thank you, Councilor. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the auditing just because I think uh, I'm curious if you happen to know when was the last time the city had an outside auditor come in and really do a deep dive at all of our accounts when when so was the last time annually at they come, yeah yeah we have external auditors that come in annually and they work they'll go across the departments and as you're saying do mm -hmm. a deep dive um, we're currently already providing our some of our um, requests that they have 
for this year's audit. Yeah. So, and yeah. I'm curious in that audit, are are you also auditing for efficiency or just the dollars? That's kind of what I want to get yeah, at. Is like, I, I think what it's I really dollars. Yeah. yeah. So this is what I, I really am curious about, like efficiency in our departments, because we have a lot of departments, um, and it would be helpful to, and I don't know who would do something like this, um, but it would be helpful to have a better understanding of our efficiency mm -hmm. in terms of kind of how we're operating. Yep. And so if, if it's never been done, is this some, is, have you heard of other cities um, that have you know, said, hey, let's take a look to see how we're, how we're functioning and if we are utilizing our dollars in the most yeah. efficient way? I, I do know that there are operational audits. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any of the departments within the city have, have engaged such a, a thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess like and we were talking about BPS so that I can get a better understanding. BPS uh, is one of those big departments yes. that um, I feel like it's trying to crack the Da Vinci Code and trying to understand what in the world. And uh, do you do you have interactions with BPS? Do you? Mostly, on, so again, mostly my interactions would be on the financial end. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the accounts that their banking accounts that they work with, or employees, payroll, mm -hmm. that that type of. That's really more where my interactions are. The auditing department would have has much more regular interaction mm -hmm. with regard to their financials, with mm -hmm. regard to the grants, as mm -hmm. as Councillor Braden mm -hmm. brought up. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we all have our different reasons to yeah. interact, yes. <clears throat> so through the chair, um, I, I'd be, did I miss the auditing hearing? Um, no, no, we did not bring. I, I, I think because there is a lot of, I mean, it would be helpful to have. Maybe I'll just put my questions in writing and. and yeah, cause we could explore it. Yeah, only just because I really do believe we're at a point in, in, well, at least I am at a point in my career here, um, is really having a better understanding because I've passed uh, 15 pieces of legislation of which some have been new departments that we've created and or positions, and we are auditing right now four pieces of legislation uh, just to see if we're really meeting the moment, right? And I think that oftentimes we, things are really good ideas, but when they come into practice, we have to evaluate whether or not we're being efficient with our dollars. And so that's where a lot of these questions are coming from. But I'm gonna go on to the law department and thank you. Um, I'm curious uh, in, the, in the case of, like, can you just, and I know Adam, you, you, you know, you got a, you got you lawyers talk funny, so I'm hoping that you could just keep it straight and direct Don't with try. me, please, because I do not want to need a, an interpreter to deal with you right now. So um, I'm curious, Adam, would you just be able to tell me how many cases have we won and how many cases have we've lost? Do so you have information like that? And if you don't have it, that's fine. But I am curious to know what the number of wins we've had and the number of losses, just because it be good to know how we're doing. Yeah, I, I do not have that breakdown in front of me, but I will gladly supplement with that because it's a great question. Yeah, I think it's, it's good to know, right? I am also curious, right, and this is gonna be, I don't know, an awkward question, but I, I'm curious. We, most of the people who are suing us tend to be Boston residents or no? I, I don't have the, the breakdown. I don't know. I mean, there's certainly a number of Boston residents who fall into that category, whether mm -hmm. it's most. Yeah. Um, so because, you know, whether it's employees, right, who have had, uh, you know, issues with the city, um, there are residents who have had issues with the city, and it just feels like a really weird dynamic in which the taxpayer is paying into a department that they then have to defend themselves 
from, mm -hmm. and I'm just curious around, like, who, whose interests are we here to really protect and serve when, when you find yourself in situations like that? I'm just curious. This is less about a budget question, and it's just more about kind of, like, help me understand what your world looks like. Yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting question because you know, we have the luxury of representing a public institution that's trying to do good stuff all day, every day, right? Um, as lawyers in the law department, our client is the city department or city employee who was doing something for the department when the department or that employee in their employee capacity is being sued. So in a lot of ways, um, you know, we are, right, so within the lawsuit, you know, our client is the department. Um, and the department has already made either a decision or has like done something through employees just in the world that caused something to happen. Um, and, and we in the law department kind of receive that decision. Meaning, so like public works has decided, mm -hmm. hey, this is a good way to empty the trash. Right? Okay. Um, so, so, sorry. Um, so our client is a city department that has taken a position here. Um, but I think that your larger question is a really important one, and sometimes what we can bring is a little bit of different perspective. Like, we may not have been the people making the decision or involved in the work, and we can sort of say, this okay. is how it's going to be seen. We think there's a risk here. Let's resolve this. Could I follow up, Chair, yes. please? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So I'm curious in regards to, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Right, and I am not even trying to be one either. I just, I, that's just not the world that I want to operate in, right? But I am a community activist and an organizer and someone who is deeply rooted in community in ways that give me an opportunity to be in this space and I want to make sure that I utilize my time uplifting that voice, right, regardless of where they're from and who they are, it's important to ask these difficult questions. And so I am curious about your interactions with the inspector general. Have you, because when people are coming up against the city, at what point do you recuse yourself and say this is, this is going to require a, you know, outside counsel or like, just because I, it, it's really, yeah. it's a really interesting dynamic to both be the protector and, 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 and serving the city and city departments, but then also having employees, right, and or residents that have issues with the city, but it's their tax dollars that are paying for your department. And mm -hmm. so therefore, I'm just curious about how we're reconciling with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I would, I would point out that it's their tax dollars that are also paying for the department that is centrally involved in the accident or the employment decision or the policy making, right? So part of our job, and it's, it is a little bit, I, I can see your frustration with it. There's a little bit of a limitation there, right? Our job really is, you know, we, we represent a department, and we are defending oftentimes um, sort of a decision that they've made, a course of action, a way of doing work um, that, you know, not only is our work funded by Boston's taxpayers, but so is our clients' work, right? So. I, I totally see that the tension you're you're talking about. I just want to sort of point out that one thing that you know exists in our relationship with our client departments is that 
they're our client. Like, we do have an obligation to say, to, to represent them, right? To not just, and oftentimes that representation might mean, like, how do we think about changing going forward? Or how do we come to an agreement here? Or how do we d defend this because you're the expert and you feel strongly and have offered, like, a lot of rationale for, like, why this is the way the department designs things to look like that or whatever. So I, I see that I see the tension you're talking about, and um, it, it is tough. But I think part of the answer is that as lawyers, we are representing um, clients, and we have to advise those clients. We have to sort of say, like, "Hey, time for a change here," or you know your practice could be improved or changed or fixed immediately this way. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is we do have an obligation to our departments, uh, but you're, you're right. Like We are lucky enough to be able to say, hey, we all want the same thing here, right? Which is not always the case in a, in a purely private setting. Right? Our departments actually do like, fundamentally want the same thing that our constituents want. They want to serve them. They want to you know, run the schools the best or like, make the streets the cleanest and nicest and smoothest and safest. So um, there is a lot of alignment, I think, between our clients and the public that they serve as well as the public that's sometimes suing us. So you're right about the, the tension. Yeah, and I, and I do appreciate the chair allowing you to complete your thought and giving me an extra time, but I do have more questions, so I'll be waiting for my third round. Okay. Councilor Fitzgerald, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you guys again. Um, small question and a big question. Small question, I think I know the answer, but still want to just confirm. Uh, when folks pay their uh, fees online and there's the processing fee of the for the credit card to do that stuff, the city does not collect that. That goes to, that is for the credit card, right? right. Some folks that had asked, correct. I just wanted to yep. confirm for them. I was pretty sure that. Of that is correct. Thank you. Uh, the larger question I have is more for, for both uh, departments is, what do we see as the biggest challenges coming up? What do you guys have on the horizon? Educate me, right? I'm only four and a half months into this thing, and you know I need to know. Uh, I'm sure some of the things that are on the horizon are maybe things that have been on the horizon for quite some time in the past as well that we might know about. But what, when you guys look ahead, what do you say, oh, man, we have to be prepared for X, uh, or this is coming to us? And how can we be helpful in, in making sure that you guys um, are sufficiently supplied to address those concerns. Um, so either one first is fine, but what keeps you up at night? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Paul, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, I think. Let's try this. Okay. I, you know, I, I think that's part of our, our daily responsibility, right? Is to look into the future and, you know, Treasury's fortunate we've, we've got a wonderful team that really is, is looking to that on a regular. So, um, you know, the nuts and bolts, if you will, the paying people and everything. Councillor Murphy asked, you know, when the numbers go, go, grow, are you prepared? Yes. You know, we're good there. Um, of course, you know, money coming in is important because we've got plenty of money going out. So. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we work on and that, you know, Jerrica's team um, spends a great deal of time on is ensuring that, you know, we all know the old adage, what goes up must come down. And right now we're, we're fortunate with the rates, you know, so we have very favorable rates and our, our revenues are, are wonderful. We are, you know, spending some of our strategy and some of our time working on ensuring that, that you know, when the Fed makes changes, we don't fall off a cliff. So we're working toward that to say, you know, if, it's, if we're budgeting $100 million this year, how can we slow that as it goes down? Because it will go down. We all know that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're working on some of those types of things within our, within our existing investment policy. So I, I, just as an example, that's one of the things we, we work on. So, so. Um, with, with collecting, it's more or less our collection rate is so high. I mean, we're 99.2% for FY23. Um, so that worries me going forward. You know, you just want to, you know, you never want to go backward. You want to keep going forward and 
get all the revenue that you can get. So I think in that case, you just get a little, you want to be sure you, you can reach out to taxpayers, make sure there's means for them to pay us. And so, yep. so that, that keeps hey. me awake a little. No, I get it. Yeah, I just wonder if you guys also see any trends, right? Oh, this is picking up more, this, or we should, you know, how do we, it, just for us to get ahead of in terms of setting up as well. It, it, there may not be an answer yeah, here, just yeah. asking. Okay. Right? Um, I don't know if the law department has any. Yeah, I, I think, as I think about the, the couple of challenges that sort of I see down the road that have me sort of focused and attentive, one is just like, always keeping the team sort of big enough and trained enough and skilled enough and experienced enough. It's, a, it's an ongoing challenge and um, the number of departments and the number of sources of legal questions, legal problems, lawsuits coming into the department, is, it's, it's really, really big. Um, and the, the core to handling that is just the team, right? It's just people doing it. And uh, sort of keeping that team there, uh, fully engaged, fully committed, uh, with you know, with the proper kind of resources to not that for that to not mean burnt out, uh, is just an ongoing challenge. And I don't see that we're still working on it. Um, this this budget proposal has some a little room for us to grow, which is not. Uh, you know, we have some a few positions to fill, which is great. They actually take time and effort to fill, so we couldn't, you know, fill a thousand new positions anyway. Uh, and then the second big challenge I see isn't, you know, sort of internal to the department, but it relates to sort of uh, information, right? Like the way the city and the world sort of creates, stores, and handles information. This includes AI, but not only. Um, you know, we. Uh, we interact with it in a few specific ways. Um, one way is like in litigation, we have an obligation to um, locate for opposing counsel the stuff that's relevant to what they're asking for, that's responsive to what they're asking for. And we are charged with um, being the ones who go out and accurately find it. You know, if you think about this institution and the thousands of employees we have creating documents and information every single day uh, across the institution um, managing that obligation over time is something that uh, we're really focused on right now because um, the ability to sort of create and store more and more information is um, you know it's it's not going away. like it's just increasing uh, so we have to, I think, modernize and make sure that um, we are kind of moving in tandem with that challenge. And uh, that's, I think, for the coming fiscal year, something that I'm really focused on and I think is a big challenge for our department. No, that's a, a great answer. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you guys. You know, I know for both Treasury and Law Department, right, there's a fine line. You don't want to have... A, a, Oh, you don't want to be over-resourced where people are looking for a case to work on and everything. So there's always striking that fine line of, of, of um, being efficient, uh, but also um, working with what you got. And you guys both do a great job of that. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Council Weber, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just a, a couple uh, follow-up questions. Um, for the law department, uh, so there's a consent decree around ADA compliance and, and curbs. Uh, my understanding is we're supposed to have everything done by 2030, but ha what's the next deadline? How are we doing? Um, I would like to primarily defer to the streets cabinet because that is uh, their work. I will say this, um, like every year, the streets cabinet produces an annual report. Um, so. They've completed this year's annual report. Um, there is, we're a little behind schedule, uh, you know, behind the annual ramp uh, production that the consent decree calls for. There are mechanisms in the consent decree for dealing with that and for catching up. Um, 
but uh, that is that is ongoing work. It's really important and challenging. Um, so I'm not saying anything that's not in the annual report. Um, so if the consent decree doesn't just you know it, it was aimed at 2030 with an understanding that it might have to continue, and uh, I think that uh, it was probably wise that that. Uh, Understanding was built in. And I, I assume that that information is shared with uh, whoever you know was on the other side. In yeah, the lawsuit. there's there um, part of the consent decree includes ongoing monitoring by class counsel, so they are very aware of this information. Okay, do you, do you know how, how how far behind? I mean, I, how many was curbs? I you, I, I, I don't do have know the, the numbers details? in front of me. I don't know. Okay, I'm uh, happy to. I can. It, it could come straight from the streets, but I'm happy to also get it to you. Don't worry. That, that, that would be great. Um, uh, and I, I guess, so what is the law department's stance on confidentiality? You know, uh, is it not allowed in any of our settlements, or do you seek, do you seek it? Uh, um, we do not seek confidentiality in our settlement agreements. Um, that's driven primarily yeah because we think that's where the law would end up anyway. Um, but also, you know, we represent the public. These are public dollars that are used to fund any settlement. All of our settlements are subject to public records law. So however we best dictate what we can redact or not, but yeah. they're all public. And then I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I, in your uh, conversation with Councillor Flynn, we were talking about a, a large settlement. We, we, would you have to get an allocation from the city approved by the city council? Um, no. Uh, we would. I mean, there would have to be sufficient money in the city, right? So, um, but uh, under under uh, the the city code, um, claims are sort of just resolved either by a court or corporation council. Okay. You know, I've, I've, I've dealt with smaller municipalities where they're like, well, we can settle the case today, but then we have to go back to, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the board of selectmen to approve this kind of thing. But we have a different system I, here. Yeah. I think if there was, it, it might be, I think if the settlement had a different budgetary impact and we didn't, and the money didn't exist, uh, that would be a different answer. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, and then um, you know, I feel like uh, you know, being on this side of things, um, you know, we're constantly, uh, I don't know, there's a there's a wall or a ceiling on what we can do based on the home rule. Um, do we have any? Does the law department have any strategies for how we can, you know, actually like govern ourselves? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, or you know where we can push, um, or do you, do you not take a, a stance on on that? Um, I I apologize. I think I would need to have like a, a longer. I I'm, I'm not sure. I completely understand. Uh, sort of. The, the question or the range of sort of options that no, we could explore. Yeah, I just, it's, so this is the, it's not what you're doing. It's just, is the law department, you know, uh, working on ways that we can, you know, uh, sort of push the envelope uh, for, you know, be, be able to enact ordinances, uh, you know, and other things that would allow us, you know, uh, sort of push back, the, you know, on the restrictions. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis and really based yeah. on what our clients want to do or, you know, this body itself has passed several home rule petitions, so it's based on what the administration and legislation wants to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I just, I didn't know if there was like a, well, let's, because I, I just, I, th I think we should work as a body to sort of see where we can push that out because I, I don't think anyone here would object on more self-governance over <laughs> city affairs. Yeah. Um, so I just, I wondered if the law department had a sort of stance on on that you know like we're talking about pilot how to obviously we want to have our institutions meet their pilot obligations you know how we can do that but um, just more generally on
Home rule. I I don't I don't think we have like a general stance on that, or at least one that we've sort of thought through and committed to as a department. I'll note, you know, that's a little bit. Um, we're not primarily a policy maker, right? So we don't uh, think. But I understand your your question. Uh, I think that for us, it would play out in terms of um, concrete defenses of city actions um, or city policies. Um, so it's sort of a general project. It's not something that uh, the law department is currently uh, involved with. Okay. Yeah, no, and, and so as an administrative law department attorney representing agencies, uh, I had a discussion with like a senior attorney uh, once about you know how, how do you you know w when you're representing this agency if you you know if you don't ne agree with what the agency's done like how how do you res you know resign yourself to work on that case and his, his response was well I can I, I take comfort in that each action taken by these agencies has been reached through the democratic process mm -hmm. so um, you know it's like I you know if, if the Public Health Commission is doing something, you know, there somebody is suing them, you're defending that, but that's I, I, so I understand, you know, you're defending that agency and its action that's been re, these people have been, you know, people have been elected who have appointed people who work there and, and they've done that. So, um, you know, I, I, I saw your, you know, uh, wrestling with that, uh, the question from, from Councillor Mejia, and I've, I've been there myself, um, you know, but. Where you're, we're representing the state against state citizens, uh, you know, is often an interesting uh, thing to deal with. But you know, it, it, again, like your role is defending is defending these decisions that are made by state, you know, entities. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely right, Councillor. Yeah. You know, the community really does control the work that we do um, with their vote, with their taxes, with the representation. That, I mean, you all are here representing them now. Um, to just really figure out like what are the mandates that need to be defended, what, are the, what is the work that needs to be done, so it really does come from both the administration and from all of you councillors. Okay, yeah, thank you very much everyone for your work and for being here today. Thank you, thank Chair. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have two questions. One is just a data request from the law department. Um, if you could provide us with pending cases and closed cases for FY21 through FY24, broken by fiscal year. And then um, I believe this question is for Treasury. On page 23 of your um, annual Treasury information statement, um, I see that there's a monthly bank account that has grown from $1.7 billion in July 2021 to more than $3 billion in February 2024. Can you just Walk me through what I'm what I'm looking at. Oh, uh, so uh, yeah. So if you're looking at you know the cash balances, so it's not one bank account; it's multiple. It's multiple. But okay. um, yeah. So much of that is a result of increased revenue due to the more money you have, the more interest you're earning, right? So mm -hmm. much of that is due to that. We've been um, we have been fortunate in the past years to be growing some of our balances. Um, and, you know, that's thanks to Celia's good work of collecting. And then we get to invest, and the more we invest, the more we're earning. But, yeah, the, that's, that's our overall cash balances. Okay. And what is this money used for? Is this like a reserves or is no, it No, it's, it's the operating budget predominantly. There, okay. are, um, there are some receipts that would be in there for grants. So if we, re, you know... Say BPS receives um, grants from DESE, um, that money would be sitting in, t in the city's bank account. Okay. Um, you know, and any of the general fund monies or the special revenue fund monies would be sitting in those bank accounts waiting to be spent. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all your hard work and thank you for being here. And I know my colleague, Council Mejia, oh, Council Braden too? Oh, sorry. I thought this, I thought this side left. Council Braden, the floor is yours. Come up with more questions. Um, I'm just curious about the, the. We get asked fairly regularly for um, information about our records and our our texts and our everything. How many uh, requests do we get for um, 
public records requests do we get and how often have we been forced to release them by a directive from the Secretary of State? Hmm. Well, I can answer the first part. The second part I don't have a number for, but uh, last year we had over 8,500 public records requests. Um, the vast majority of which we fulfilled, right? There's probably some where there are fights or um, somebody's looking for something or somebody lost track of it. Um, but the vast majority of those were filled and, you know, actually our average turnaround time improved some last year, but, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a huge workload and honestly it's like going up rapidly. You know, just a few years ago that number was probably around 3,000 a year. So it's you know, tripled in about three years. Mm -hmm. um, we've added some resources to the public records team. We're going to be adding some more resources in the coming fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how many uh, records we disclose because the uh, supervisor of records ordered us to, I can follow up with yeah. you. I don't no. have a clear number. No, I'm just, I just wanted to get a ballpark figure because that's, that's a significant, significant amount of work. Yeah, and just as a note, uh, I'll it. Uh, just as a note, we do have, you know, SPR appeals coming through just like any municipality, and people can appeal to the supervisor of public records for any reason, um, whether or not, you know, we have actually given everything that we have or not. Um, and often that decision is to disclose whatever we have. And so it's kind of an ongoing conversation with the requester to see uh, what exactly they're looking for, what they think they're missing, or what they think we haven't turned over. But a lot of times it's, uh, it really, we really rely on our article clerk and paralegal over in public records, and actually on Sean Williams, our director, yeah. to make sure that he's having those conversations and keeping those lines of communication open so we can best serve. We don't want to give uh, constituents just, or you, know, you don't have to be a constituent to make a request. We don't want to give people um, unnecessary documents when they're really looking for something specific. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to bog them down either. Narrow, narrow the field to know exactly uh, respond to their specific concerns and questions. Um, the other, um, I know that you know this. Um, I know you can't speak to um, pending or current um, litig uh, litigation. Um, the Boston Public Schools administrators suing the former public schools administrator suing the district for allegedly uh, being pushed out because she raised concerns. She was like a whistleblower. Um, and I know this, there's a lot of coverage of um, concerns about uh, a pattern of um, disciplinary or punitive action against folks in BPS. And, and then they're subject to a non-disclosure agreement. Like, is that, is that subject to public record? law, like if, this, if BPS has a non-disclosure agreement with somebody who they've pushed out, um, is that something that the public records is, is would, would they be required to disclose the, the monies that they've been spending on non-disclosure? Hmm. Um, Councillor, I, I, I apologize. I don't know enough to answer that question. Right. So, um, I don't know about, I mean, like, I, I just am not familiar enough with the specific setup you're talking about to sort of weigh in on whether something would be subject to public disclosure records. under the public records law or whether it would be exempt under one of the sort of codified exemptions to the law. I just you know, without understanding this a lot more and then have an opportunity to give it to the team, you know, unfortunately I just can't say, oh yeah, that thing sounds like something that would or wouldn't be. I don't, yeah. I don't we know. also don't keep a repository of any type of agreements that would fall under that category. Um, it's not something we... You, you, your department, your section... Our department does not have a... But surely BPS would have that record. If such a record exists. Yeah, so they're dishing out money and not keeping a record of where the money's going. <laughs> I'm sure they're not. I'm sure they're not. <laughs> well, that, you know, uh, anyway, that, that was a rather. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, Councilor Mejia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to Councillor Breeden's question in regards to what information exists and what doesn't and how all that looks. Yeah. And this leads me back to the transparency piece, right? I think that um, while I do appreciate the fact that a lot of this information is public, allegedly, that we should start figuring out where real transparency lives here within the city of Boston. So having a sort of dashboard or something that um, people can sort through. Like I'm curious to know how many cases, uh, you know, how much money we've spent in the last year on, you know, settlements. What's do we know the dollar or not? Um, no. Uh, how I, I come didn't, we don't know that? No, I don't have that in in front of me right now. But somebody has it. Yeah, that's in that's America something that we that. track, right? How yes. much money we're spending on yeah. lawsuits? Yeah, and I've already been um, asked today to provide that to the council as a follow-up, and I will do so. The reason why I'm asking this specifically to you, Adam, as the person who oversees this department, it is important for us to have full confidence that you know how much money we are spending, and that that information should be readily available especially when we're talking about budget season, because we need to be able to prepare for that. And so I would, through the chair, would appreciate that number. Um, and I'm curious, do you happen to know the buckets in which these lawsuits fall under? How many are in, you know, HR related? How many are like, can, do you have that? Is that easily and readily available? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. It is something that we can provide as a follow-up. Do you have um, a sense? Without going well, too much into details. Yeah, yeah. I should um, be a lawyer right now. Do you have a sense, yes or no? I mean, <laughs> so in 2023, we had sort of just shy of... 200 lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Of uh, which, how many were? Well, there, you know, I, I know that employment suits were a small fraction of that. I would say under 20, but I will mm -hmm. provide a list that has specific follow-up. Um, the majority are Courts cases, right? Chapter 258, whether it's um, right, sort of uh, negligence on behalf of uh, city, or alleged ne negligence on behalf of city employees, um, you know, auto accidents, things of that nature. Um, there are civil rights claims. Um, those are typically uh, against the Boston Police Department. Um, there's a large portion of that, almost 200, are sort of challenges to city regulatory decisions. So zoning, historic district commissions, things of that nature. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that, particularly in regards to the planning and development. You know, you guys have just acquired a whole new department. And because there's been so many questions and or concerns around transparency and community oversight, what can you anticipate um, if so many of these cases have come now in terms of volume? Yeah. I, think, I think that for the volume, I do not expect a huge uptick. Okay. Um, the majority of our sort of land use litigation uh, actually comes out of the Zoning Board of Appeal. Like people either get a variance or deny the variance, mm -hmm. and one side or the other uh, sues us. Um, I'm talking. What I'm curious, that so that way we can like yeah. be speaking the same language. Yeah. Uh, so that maybe I should ask my question differently. I'm curious specifically around, you know, we are now moving towards a. Um, a, a focus more on the planning part of the development. 
And I'm curious when community, particularly community, right, um, is pushing back on a specific project mm -hmm. um, and they're digging their heels, kind of what role, do, who, like when it's time to litigate or yeah. stand up or push back, what role will you all play in that? Yeah. Um, our role will be, I think, sort of twofold, right? One, we can advise client departments while they're in the process, right? So maybe they'd say like, oh, you know, should we have another meeting, things like that. Um, and two is once they've kind of completed their process, and they say, you know, we've done it, we've heard, like we've, we've done our process and we think this should be the plan and we think we should enact this as a plan, whether that means, um, you know, I think a lot of times it might mean amending the zoning code, something along these lines. Um, you know, again, we ultimately will, if there's a lawsuit, let's say it's a planning question and they, come up with a new plan for a particular neighborhood and they put it into the zoning code, we will be involved in okay. defending a lawsuit against the change to the zoning code. So okay. people might right. sue over so, that. <laughs> okay. I am, maybe it's because I'm just, it's, yeah, no, no, I'm trying I to track you, I, yeah. but I, it's, I'm, yeah. I, I have lost. Sorry, the, let, me, the, let me try but, again. The, no, that's okay. okay. I, I feel like I'm, I only have a minute left and I have a few more questions. So I'll just have to research it and Google it and figure it out. I yeah. just don't worry let, about let it. Me, no, 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 no. Sorry. no. Let me just take one more try and just say yeah, this. Yeah, because it's when, very when, hard. Like when a department, you know, goes through a planning process, let's say, and they sort of enact or announce a new policy as a result of whatever their process was, one of the law department's jobs, uh, and there's a lawsuit about it, is to represent that department in a lawsuit about its policy. Thank you. But this is the question, and this, I keep going back to the tension, because your job is to defend and protect and serve the department. Right, And I think as we continue to have these conversations, there has to be some space for us to define and or get clear about what that looks like for the taxpayers <laughs> in terms of their, their rights. And I just feel like th there's, just, there's something that is just not clear for me. And we're not gonna discuss it and, and figure it out today, but I think um, it is important to have those conversations. Um, so, and I really do appreciate you really ch helping me try to understand. And I'm going to ask the chair to allow me one more minute. One more, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, I want to go back to, um, and, and, I, and I don't remember if you answered the, the question, uh, in terms of the, your relationship and or interaction with, um, the inspector general's office, right? Like at what point do you, you know, how, what's your relationship and how do you interact with them? And then I'm also curious about the interpretation of the law because what I have seen in my work here, and even though we've only passed almost, yeah, 15 pieces of legislation. We've gone back and forth, and oftentimes it's been with your department in terms of how you're interpreting what we believe, and then we have to get Megan or whoever is our attorney to go back and forth. And even within that, we approved your budget, right? And oftentimes we hope that there's a level of relationship here, but oftentimes what we want to do, there's a push and pull between the council and the administration. And I'm just curious if you could just talk a little bit about that dynamic and ways that you can uh, figure out how we can improve it. Um, and then I do have a question for Treasury since you guys have been so incredibly patient with me and here. Um, it's going to be really about, I'm really excited to hear that we have all this extra money, but you know, there's so many issues that we are facing here in the city of Boston, particularly around housing. And I'm curious, as we continue to have these really difficult conversations, what, if any, uh, uh, you know, guidance can you offer in terms of 
how we can utilize those reserves to really meet the moment. And I know you're going to answer, but that's not taking you off the hook, Adam, because I do want those questions answered too. Okay. So I, I will say that, yeah, when you, you refer to those as reserves, and, and unfortunately they're not that. They're, they're, you know, increased revenues that are spoken for, most of them. So as I said, you know, when, when Chair Worrell asked about balances, our balances are any point in time, right? So we may have, you know, just to receive some large grant monies from DASI or, you know, I'd be guessing at what might have been, you know, we may um, have received a large portion of money at that time. So, so th you may see some differences in balances, but they're spoken for. Okay. Um, and, and again, we're in that, you know, balanced budget concept of what comes in must go out. So um, there aren't really reserves per se. Um, so sorry. <laughs> well, thank you for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. And for those who are tuning in, there's no reserves, right? There's, there's, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, just don't. So Adam, I hope that gave you a yeah. little bit of time to really kind of, and you know, I think that everyone is, I'm a different type of communicator, right? And so for me, it, it's really helpful to just, I just, I, I may not even want to hear the answer, but it's better for me to hear it in the best way that you can just articulate it so that I can really absorb it. And I know that your job is not to help me understand your language, but it is really important for me to understand your answer so that I can have a really good command of this conversation. So I'm just gonna ask you to find your teacher voice if you need to, but I really need things to be as simple as possible so that I can really understand what that looks like. Um, so with respect to the Inspector General, uh, we, we do deal with them some. The Inspector General is our, our regulator, is mm -hmm. one of uh, our regulators. Um, so our office is often um, like a first line of interfacing with them because they have the authority to and do uh, sort of investigate things, right? So they, you know, they will often uh, come to us and let us know, hey, we're looking for this information, um, and we often play like a coordinating role and sort of an ongoing role, usually in Inspector General's investigation, um, doesn't start and stop with one set of documents, um, and they, you know, often gather information, understand it, and move on from there. Uh, so our office plays sort of a, a coordinating um, role, and we've worked with them. Or, you know, it's, yeah, I, it, it's we've worked with them on a number of things, and we can continue to do so. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about the interpretation of... Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I would Because say, that's where I feel like the politics of politics gets really mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. I, I would say that it, in our department, you know, um, our attorneys just, you know, oftentimes just have to sort of say, oh, we think that this thing is consistent with the charter or is it? And they're, you know, here's the, the rule I'm looking at and, and, and why I think that. So um, as a department, we try to really just stay focused on like, whatever legal questions are presented to us, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, any city official can present us with a, a, a legal question. Council as a body can, a, a, a committee as a body can, and um, so sometimes I know, you know, we are maybe advising IGR or you know corresponding with them, um, and they're free to share mm -hmm. things we said. That's up to the client. Um, so I think that mm -hmm. you know we don't have like a particular kind of like philosophy about interpretation other than, you know, we just answer questions that we get. I appreciate that. Because what I really struggle with, um, or at least I'm learning, is we have so many different 
ordinances on the books. And I just don't know if we have a real understanding of these pieces of legislation that we have passed and whether or not we have the tools or the infrastructure in place to really audit these, um, you know, statues, right, if you will. And I think that we have an opportunity to hold ourselves to some level of, you know, standard. And, you know, I'm not sure if it would be your department that does that. Is there somebody in your office that looks at all the statues and are, you know, some of them were passed in 1980, some of them were in 1970, yeah. some of them in 1950. Like, I am really curious, and this is why I keep going back to the auditing piece of it, because in order for government to be efficient, we need to make sure that we understand what it is that we set out to do and that we're doing it. And if we're not doing it, and because times have changed, which pieces of legislation need to be updated to meet the moment? Like, that's the level of, of that, that's why I, I think we, the city, can benefit from having a different type of oversight. Not to say that you are not doing a good job, because I don't want that to be the impression, but there has to be some sort of independent body or some or there maybe another department or something that makes sure that we are not creating departments for the sake of creating departments or positions for the sake of creating positions. If those if if we haven't even done an evaluation of what we already have in place. Like I just don't know how we are functioning as a city if we can't have a handle on these things. And I, I'm not gonna ask you to you know, take full responsibility, but I even look at this budget. There's a clothing allowance here for $1,000. Who y'all dressing up for $1,000? We, like, we have, well, who's that we, for? We have some, <laughs> we have some uh, employees who are in unions that uh, we require a okay. stipend. Okay, I was worried. I thought it was y'all that we were. I was like, wait. And then contract, con, um, contractual um, services is two million dollars, right? I would love to have a breakdown of who are you contracting with. I believe that's part of the appendix to our budget presentation, officially from OBM. But who are you, like? It'll show, like, line by line by line. Where? Every single person. It's an appendix to, like, the presentation to the questions that OBM we, provides. Okay. We can email it to you. Can you email it to me? Because I'm, I'm just curious. Look, I appreciate you all spending here so much time. I know you're hungry. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to keep you here any longer because the goal is to end at one. But I still have a lot of questions. I still, there's still some things that... More so for the law department, less for a treasurer, just because y'all just bring in the money and send it out and make sure that, <laughs> that we're doing right by it. But I just think that when it comes to the law department, and because there's so much of it is about government accountability and transparency, um, and I really want to make sure that we're restoring trust with people, I, I, I feel like I'm still a little bit unclear about some things. And so I do appreciate the time that you have provided us. and. I'm grateful, and I, I'm not going to hold you all hostage, but thank you. Councilor Braden? All done? I could yield my time another three minutes to you, Councilor Mejia. Okay. We'll get out by yes. after this round. All right, so I, I, this, is the last, this is the last question. I, I always talk about a dashboard. I think I mentioned it earlier. And with the Boston Jobs Residency, um, do you guys interface with, with, with that ordinance? Do you keep tabs every, you know, twice a year? We, we, are, we hold a hearing, we talk about our hiring and our goals and all that. Are, are you familiar with, with that ordinance, Adam? I am familiar with the ordinance. Um, and I think the office that sort of implements it and monitors it is in the workers' empowerment cabinet. 
Um, so yes, I'm familiar with the ordinance. So the reason why I ask is because that ordinance has very specific deliverables and things that we should be held accountable to, which is another example of why it's important for us to review consistently what has been passed. And we need to figure out what changes need to be made and how we're holding ourselves accountable to that. So I am happy that you are familiar in the department that it lies in. I am concerned that in the four years that we've, I've been here, I keep hearing the same thing. And at some point, from a legal perspective, there needs to be a level of accountability that we can hold ourselves accountable to in terms of the expectations of when that piece of legislation was written. And I don't think we are meeting that. And I think that's why I keep asking who is overseeing the overseer. I believe that we do need some sort of infrastructure for that. Is there somebody in your department that provides you or other members of your team with guidance around, do you, well first, how many pieces of, how many ordinances or statutes or whatever you want to call them exist in the city of Boston? Oh, I, I, I do not know. I agree that the code is large. Mm -hmm. but I don't know. Okay, it, and, and that's not a fair question, but could I ask you this one then? Because there's so many. Can you name at least five that you believe are the most important um, in terms of governance? Right. I, I don't have a good answer to that, Counselor. Um, can you share any particular threats or concerns that you think we should be mindful of that you know the city council and the city you know i know councillor weber mentioned the satanic situation i don't know what will come of that but i'm curious are there other things that we need to be mindful of as we continue to navigate the world of politics or anything that you've heard in other cities that you know were being other cities being sued for specific things. Are there other trends? I guess is what I'm trying to get at. I think this specifically speaks to one of the goals that we presented on today of trying to see you know what is upcoming, what are the changes that we're seeing. We know there's been things with um, you know things hitting the Supreme Court that end up affecting the way that our departments can serve our constituents. And when it comes to legislation that needs to be you know either revamped, revisited, um, we are not a legislative body, and you all luckily hold that, that responsibility. So it really is a question of uh, whatever our departments, our client departments are looking to do, whatever the administration is looking to do, and whatever you as a body are wanting to change and make updates to. It's uh, our pleasure to serve at the leisure of our clients. Um, and again, as Adam said, to answer any questions that do come before us, but we are not a legislative body that makes any changes to the law. No, I'm clear on that. I guess what I'm trying to have a better understanding of is that in the climate that we live in, it is important to understand what is trending mm -hmm. so that if you happen to have a sense of that, that whatever information you have would be helpful to yeah. this legislative body, not that you would be advising us of mm -hmm. such, but it's just good to get ahead of things. Yeah. I, I don't have a, a ready answer to that, but I, I think it's a very important question and um, for, for us to reflect on if we see anything big, making sure that we you know, communicate it to this body as well as our, our other clients. But I don't have a good list of impending, like what I consider sort of like the big threats coming up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all. Thank you. Likewise, thank you, Thank you, Councilor. Thank, thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Um, again, thank you guys for all the work that you do. Thank you for uh, being here and presenting to us in this hearing on dockets number 0670 through 0678 is adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.